Uh, let me just repeat that unfortunately we have a very tight schedule. So I will uh, be forced to really keep you on time. So I'll, uh, I, I will tell you at the beginning when I will uh, pop up to give you a warning. So let me start with our first speaker, which is Marco Fairburn. So Malcolm, would you please share your screen? Ah, great. And uh, we, we are not hearing you. Let me see. Malcolm? I... Malcolm, we're not. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Right. <clears throat> okay, great. So you have 20 plus five minutes. Uh, I will give you a warning at 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. okay uh, he hello, everybody. Hello, friends. I hope you're all okay. I hope you're having a good pandemic. I hope, no, but seriously, I hope that you're all well. And, um, it's been a difficult year and it's lovely to see so many of you. Thank you to the organizers for organizing this lovely meeting. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, there's six times as much dark matter as normal matter. Um, that is six times as much, actually. It looks, doesn't look like it, but it is. Uh, if dark matter is a particle, what kind of a particle is it? It's certainly invisible. We can't see it but we haven't detected any yet. Uh, what can we find out about it without interacting with it directly? Of course, we should try and interact with it directly, and I'm all for trying to build machines to interact with it directly, but I'm also interested in what we can find out about it without touching it, just in case it takes a while before we're able to do that. And today I'm gonna to talk about two methods to constrain dark matter without seeing it or touching it or catching it. We're going to talk about strong lensing probes of dark matter. How do we learn more about dark matter if we can't see it? I'm going to talk about galactic probes of fermionic dark matter. <clears throat> okay, so you all know the concept of an escape velocity. Different planets have got different escape velocities. Uh, it's easier to escape from Earth. It's easier to escape from Mars than it is from Earth. Um, the Milky Way has got an escape velocity, of course. You need to go about 550 kilometers per second to escape from the Milky Way. So we know that dark matter must be traveling less quickly than this because we know that it is isn't present in galaxies like the Milky Way. And if it was moving faster than that, then it wouldn't. It would escape. Um, dark matter is also present in dwarf galaxies. So, but they've got a much, much smaller escape velocity, something like 20 kilometers per second. Um, so we know that it must be moving at least this slow, okay? And when people do simulations where you've got different amounts of speed that the dark matter starts off with, you see that because of this thing with escape velocities, if it starts off moving quite fast, it only gets captured in the biggest structures and the smallest galaxies don't capture any dark matter at all. Um, but if the dark matter starts off moving rather slowly, then you get lots and lots of little galaxies around the big galaxies that it's able to fall into and get captured by because, uh, they've, because it's got a low velocity, so it's not above the escape velocity of those potential worlds. And this leads to a, a halo mass function. So you get different amounts of, this tells you basically how many halos you get in a given simulation, depending on how fast the dark matter is moving. So here, if we've got a smaller mass, it means that the dark matter started off moving more quickly. And if you've got cold dark matter, you get halos, halos all the way down, this black line that goes all the way. But if the dark matter starts moving quickly, then you see you cut off uh, smaller halos. They can't be formed in the simulation because the dark matter is moving so quickly that They've got an escape, they've got a velocity which is bigger than the escape velocity corresponding to those small halos. Now, as we saw in Gianfranco's talk yesterday, if we discover these small halos uh, gravitationally, then we will learn more about the dark matter. In particular, we'll learn more about how quickly it was moving when it was created in the early universe. And one of the ways that people are doing this is to look for streams. These streams that are due to things like globular clusters that get tidally disrupted in the gravitational potential of the Milky Way and form these long elongated streams. Those streams can sub subsequently get perturbed by dark matter halos as they pass through them, small dark matter halos, because you can have dark matter halos going all the way down to zero, 
Uh, hey, can you, could you all turn your microphones off if you're not me, please? That's not me being egotistical, although I am quite narcissistic, but that's a conversation for another day. Right, so um, these streams, they will get perturbed by smaller subhalos. The thing is, even if you've got very, very small subhalos, you won't be able to see them because if you've got a, the smallest subhalos that we expect to have stars in is something around 10 to the nine solar masses or something. If it's smaller than that, or like 10 to the seven solar masses, you don't expect any stars to form in there because as soon as a star forms and creates a supernova, it'll blow all the gas out because the escape velocity is so small. So you just expect them to be made out of dark matter, these smaller halos. So it's difficult to see them. But as they pass through these streams, they can perturb the streams, as we saw yesterday. So that's interesting. Now, today I'm going to talk about another potential way of seeing these things, and that's through gravitational lensing. So let me give you an example of, uh, this is the subhalos that would be present inside a big galaxy, which has got a mass of 10 to the 13 solar masses. And it depends upon how far down your subhalos go. So if you have subhalos all the way down to 10 to the 9 solar masses, you see you don't have many. But if you've got a, a colder dark matter, such that you have subhalos all the way down to 10 to the 8 solar masses, then you've got more. 10 to the 7, you've got even more. And if you go down to 10 to the 6, you have a huge number of uh, dark matter halos contributing. They don't contribute a great deal to mass, but they do contribute in the fact that they're present. Now, what we would like to do is we'd like to see is, and, and we're not the only people trying to do this, right? We would like to see that uh, whether it's possible to deduce the presence or the absence of those small mass subhalos by using gravitational lensing. So if we say that we have a galaxy in the middle, uh, a galaxy which is acting as a lens, can we tell whether that lens galaxy is, is made up of more or fewer small mass dark matter halos. In other words, can we tell whether we've got warm dark matter or cold dark matter by looking at gravitational lensing? So what we do, uh, let me, so here's a video. We're moving the source now. This is the source which is moving in orientation relative to the lens, which is in the middle. And of course, as it goes close to the middle, it goes behind it, you get this Einstein ring. And we've simulated a huge number of these by changing the, the position of the source relative to the position of the lens with and without uh, different amounts of substructure going down to different masses, okay? And here at the top, this is, these are some of the images that we get from our simulated lensing where the minimum halo mass is 10 to the nine solar masses. And at the bottom, these images are the lensed images that we get. They're, they're all due to random configuration, so they all look a bit different from each other. But here, the substructure inside the lens goes down to 10 to the 6 solar masses. Now, can you tell the difference? I can't tell the difference, and none of my PhD students who don't have astigmatism can tell the difference either. But of course, we can get machine learning to see if it can tell the difference. So then we bring in a young person. In this case, it was Sridevi Varma, who's my PhD student. And we say, let's use machine learning to see if we can tell the difference, if we can identify whether these subhalos have got small structure in them. <clears throat> and it turns out that we can. So we use convolutional neural networks, which are uh, neural networks that are particularly good at analyzing images. And what we do is we treat it like a, a classification. So we, we split up um, our simulations into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bins, going down to 10 to the nine, 10 to the 8.5, 10 to the eight, all the way down to 10 to the six solar masses. And we, we create lenses. Um, we create galaxies with a random distribution of subhalos in them, and we use them to lens a galaxy behind them, which is also allowed to move around and also change its shape and what have you in its size. And then we use machine learning to see if we can, by looking at the lensed image, whether we can re um, recover the cutoff in the halo mass function that corresponded to that particular image. And, and we can, um, to some degree, we can. I mean, uh, under certain conditions, we're able to do that. So what we're doing now is we're trying to see if we can uh, prove that we can do that, for example, when baryons are present and also in more general situations. So I think 
this is quite a very this is a very promising um, avenue to try and understand if there is substructure and there are lots of different groups um, around the world currently working on this and it's quite exciting and it'll be interesting to see if this method or the streams method or another method that one of you young people invents is is the first one to tell us whether this substructure in, exists inside uh, dark matter halos now the other reason we might not have detected dark matter at a dark matter detector is that it might be too light. It might be because it doesn't matter what mass it is, it's traveling at the same speed inside the galaxy. So if it's a low mass dark matter particle, it'll be still be traveling around 200 kilometers per second. And when it hits our detector, it might not dump enough kinetic energy to make the detector go bong. OK, so in that case, we wouldn't detect it either. But then. If it's a fermion, of course, then if it's very, very light, then we can put a constraint on it in a different way, okay? Now, if you, some of you may be aware of, I'm sure that a lot of you are aware of the fact that originally in 1979, Gunn and Tremaine pointed out that if dark matter is made out of fermions, then there's only so many dark matter particles you can put in some region because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And they came up with a constraint back then, and that was, back in the days when people were taking the neutrino as a, seriously as a dark matter candidate. And the Gunn and Tremaine bounds uh, were based upon um, galactic observations. And they, they were not very strong, but it was obviously trailblazing work. And what we've done recently is we've updated those bounds. Uh, I literally haven't had a phone call for 48 hours and I get one in the middle of a talk. Right, apologies for that. And the, what we did to do that was we looked at the dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, and you, you see the, the Milky Way, of course, has got a dark matter halo, which has got a mass of about 10 to the 12 solar masses, but it's surrounded by many dwarf galaxies that have got much smaller masses, 10 to the eight, 10 to the, 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine, solar masses, okay? Now those dwarf galaxies have got a small, uh, they've got bigger densities because they were formed earlier on in the universe, so they have bigger concentration parameters reflecting the, the density at the time when they were formed. And they also have smaller velocity dispersions because they're smaller uh, potential wells. So in six dimensional phase space, they're, they're a lot denser than the Milky Way. So you wanna look at those, objects rather than the Milky Way itself, if you want to put a constraint using the Pauli exclusion principle. The, this is the paper that we wrote. So it's not just our group in London. We joined forces with the group in, in, um, in Leiden, uh, Boyarski's group, uh, and that's the archive reference. And these are the young people, some of whom are looking for jobs right now, James Alvey, Nashwan Sabti, and Victoria Tiki. I can recommend those young people to you without hesitation. So um, these are the dwarf galaxies that we considered. Now it's quite difficult to figure out how much dark matter there is in a dwarf galaxy. And that's because you've got very limited information about what's going on there. You've only got the line of sight velocity dispersion. You've only got the line of sight of the stars in that dwarf, dwarf galaxy. And, and trying to go from the, the mass, you start off with the mass, and then you have to solve the genes equation inside the galaxy to work out what the radial velocity dispersion is here. But this involves this beta function here. And this beta function tells you how circular the orbits are and how radial they are. And you don't know what that is because you can't go to the galaxy and have a look around at what the stars are doing. So now we're looking at the tracer stars here. This is the velocity dispersion of the tracer stars. We can't go there and have a look. And they're too far away to get proper motions from Gaia. So we've only got the line of sight velocity. So we have to marginalize over this beta parameter. And then once we've done that and come up with a, a, a sigma r, which is consistent with what we see, we then have to integrate it in order to get the line of sight velocity dispersion. And this leads to this famous beta degeneracy. And that's that when we change and look at different values of beta, there is one radius at which the enclosed mass is well, it's well constrained, and that's the half-light uh, radius of the galaxy. So it's the, the projected radius within which half of the stars lie. We can get a good, uh, estimate of the mass at that radius. But if you look closer to the center of the galaxy, you get wildly, wildly different predictions for the mass down there. So if you try and work out the density down there, you're in trouble. 
So what we've tried to do is we've tried to build on some work that uh, we've been looking at in our group uh, for a while. Uh, and in particular, Justin Reed's been looking at it as well. It's based Malcolm. on Merrifield and Kent's work in 1990. We're not only looking at the second moment of the distribution, we're also looking at higher moments of the distribution, like the fourth moment, so that we can look at whether the line of sight distribution, not only it's Gaussian width, but it's kurtosis. So whether Malcolm. it's to kurt or Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. You have five plus five remaining. Thank you very much. Yeah. And then what we, we still have this problem. Now this, we still have this problem that we don't know what beta is. So we have to marginalize over this beta based upon simulations. And we do that, but it turns out if you use this additional information about the line of sight velocity, you can get tighter constraints on the density. And so you can break these degeneracies. You can, to some degree, you can break these beta degeneracies. And uh, quite a lot of people have been testing this and seeing whether it works. And it seems to have some efficacy. Um, and you can get tighter constraints on the density as a function of radius inside these dwarf galaxies. You also get good, good information about the density as a function of radius. So, By, by looking at the density as a function of radius, you can get the mass as a function of radius, which means that you can then solve the genes equation again for the dark matter. Um, and then you can also, uh, you can get a type, and then using the improved information about both the velocity and the density of dark matter, you can look at the phase space density of dark matter in these objects. And you can say, well, if they're fermions, I can only explain my observations if they've got a mass greater than 0.27 keV, okay? So now what you can then do is you can look at more specific models like sterile neutrinos, where you have specific information about um, the particular distribution of velocities in the early universe, and you can get a constraint uh, on the mass of the neutrino there. And here you can see for different mixing angles, This is resonantly produced sterile neutrino models. For different mixing angles, you can see that you have to be on the right-hand side of this line here. Now, this constraint that we're getting for sterile neutrino models, it's not as strong as the one you get from Lyman Alpha. However, you could argue that it's much more robust because we're talking about objects that are a lot closer to us rather than things that existed at high redshift where thing, we might be more uncertain about what's going on. So um, by, by using these higher moments, I think uh, there's a lot of different uses of these higher moments that are going on in the literature at the moment. So if you look at some of the recent papers by Reed and Janina and Reed, for example, they're using these techniques to see if we can learn more about the behavior of dark matter and whether some of the dark matter profiles are actually um, cuspy as opposed to being cored. And this, this kind of analysis has led people to believe that uh, there is a relationship between how cuspy a dwarf galaxy is and how cored it is um, based upon the, where the star formation has recently occurred. Now, I think it's really important when I've got an audience like the one that I've got today, that people go away and read those papers. Because if you write a paper saying that, there's a, that dwarf seroidals are cored and you want to explain it using axions or what have you, then I think you really need to get on top of the state of the art gal galaxy literature when it comes to these issues, because the situation is not as clear cut as you think it is, okay? Anyway, so we are well into an era of using novel lensing approaches to learn more about the nature of dark matter. And um, strong lensing approaches to detecting substructure with machine learning are currently being developed and refined. And We've tried to get involved with this and we've seen uh, what you're able to do. It, it does seem that it might be a promising route, although this is very early days. And it's one thing for me to do it with a test sample that I invented on my computer and I have complete control over. And it's quite another thing for me to apply these machine learning algorithms, having trained them myself on actual data from a telescope. So that will be uh, a challenge with all sorts of systematics in that will have to be dealt with. Um, New techniques to study dwarf galaxies and new techniques to solve the genes equation can lead to new insights on dark matter. And uh, precision astronomical probes continue to give us more information about the dark stuff, whatever it is or isn't. So thank you very much for listening. 
Thank you very much, Malcolm, for the very nice talk and also for staying perfectly on time. So we have uh, five minutes uh, for questions. So I see, I see them. Mikhail has a question, so please, Mikhail. Yeah, hi, um, very nice talk. Um, I'm interested about this application of strong lensing to detect the substructure. And in particular, I'm interested what kind of sources you were considering and which kind of experiments looking at these sources were you considering? Yeah. So we were considering... Uh, oh, the first thing to say is that you, you need... Um, the source we were considering, we were using just a SIRSIC profile, okay? Um, so we were just assuming a SIRSIC profile, so it's something that doesn't have any uh, substructure in it itself. And so I'm not trying to suggest that when you start to have, you know, more complicated sources that things are going to go smoothly, okay? This is something which is, as far as we're concerned, we're just starting it. It's a journey, and this is going to be difficult for people to solve. The other thing to say is that the lens that we're considering is um, it has to have quite a high uh, concentration for such a massive object, because in order for it to be a strong lens, it needs to be quite unusual. But I think that's quite normal. So uh, the kind of lenses that you would need to get a good strong lensing, they would be sort of in the tails of the distribution when it comes to concentration parameter in a simulation. Does that answer your question? Have you got a follow-up question? Um, yeah, sure. No, um, yeah, I'm happy with this answer. And uh, I w the other part of my question was, which kind of experiments would be able to detect this? So did you have some particular experiment in your mind? Or Right, so uh, people are talking about using uh, ALMA experiments. Uh, at the moment, we just sort of used um, typical um, the typical resolution that people have got when they do these kind of experiments. But uh, I think um, the next stage would be to see um, whether we can increase the, the resolution with, so for example, with different wavelength observations that have got different resolutions. Because when we start to mix things up and generalize them a bit more, we're having more difficulty re-getting um, re, re the stuff that we put in. So this works for situations that are quite under control for the time being. We think we're doing a little bit better than some other people have done in the literature, but we realize that this is not the end and what we've done so far is not enough to get this technique to work. The thing is that the, the, the difficulty is that when you've got so many lenses, it takes a long time to generate the lensing image. So if we go to higher resolution, that's gonna take even longer. And then uh, I'm gonna to have to apply for some serious computer time. At the moment, I've just been using our, our limited facilities at KCL. Okay, yeah, I understand. Um, I understand your point. Thank you for the question. Thanks. So we have time for another quick question. So I see Maria. Maria, please come forward. Hi, can you hear me? Right. Yes. yes. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the very nice talk. So my question is related to your work on dwarf galaxies. So if I'm not mistaken, you are using Gens equations, so you are assuming a steady state or dynamic equilibrium. So how well this assumption uh, is, or how well this, this can be applied to dwarf galaxies that are merging or orbiting our own gravitational potential? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> so, of course, here's the Jeans equation. In order to get it to look like this, uh, what the, the person who was asking the question is pointing out that this assumes that the, um, the phase space distribution has reached an equilibrium, and it's not immediately clear whether that's always the case. Um, the, the short answer to that is that we, we sort of, we look at those systems that we sort of trust as being reasonably isolated that don't have any obvious shocking going on in them. But the, the, the of course we are assuming that they're basically in, in equilibrium. So um, it would be nice, uh, Anna, Anna's raised her hand. Anna might have something interesting to say about that. Yeah, um, unfortunately we're running out of time. Okay. So if it's a 10 seconds, uh, 
uh, intervention, Anna, please go ahead. Otherwise, I will have to ask you to move the discussion to the private chat, unfortunately. Or to save it, we were going to have 15 minutes at the end of the session. So if you're all around, we can resume it there. OK, I can um, say something later then. OK, OK, thank you very much. I'm really sorry. It's, uh, it's a very unfortunate that I, I have to catch you. So Malcolm, thanks again uh, a lot. It was a very nice talk. Uh, thanks for accepting talking. And uh, it was good to see you. Yeah, you too. Stay safe, everybody. You too. OK, so I think we can move on. So uh, Andrew. Hey, can you hear me OK? Uh, let me just uh, uh, give a quick announcement. So we, since Marcos uh, is, uh, ju just solved this problem, so we decided to move uh, his talk at the end of the session. So after Andrew, we will have you <laughs> and Peter, then Alexis, and so on. OK, so you will rescale by one. So, uh, Andrew, you're going to have uh, 15 plus 5. I'm going to give you a warning at, at 10 minutes. Okay? okay, great. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Andrew Cheek. I'm from UC Levin in Belgium. And thanks very much to the organizers for having me speak today. I've really enjoyed this uh, workshop and uh, I hope uh, to attend the next one in person. So, today I'm going to talk about um, this paper, um, which is the product of uh, two dark matter phenomenologists, myself and Chiara Arena talking to two uh, EFT um, SMEF uh, experts in, uh, in UC Levan and uh, realizing that there's still you know, a, few, um, a few kind of basic things that we can uh, uh, learn about possible solutions for dark matter from really the basics of uh, EFT, um, EFT physics. Okay, so time is short, so I'll get straight into it. So everything we know about dark matter says that it's electromagnetically neutral or at most millicharged. At the same time, photons are a primary messenger for astrophysical and cosmological probes. Uh, for the most part, this isn't a problem, as this uh, figure on the right shows, um, because standard model particles are hadronized and they radiate, and so in the end, we get, uh, we get photons out from uh, astrophysical processes or pr uh, processes that could happen. Also, generically, BSM scenarios um, can have uh, heavy charged particles, and that will co couple your dark matter to photons uh, via loops, you know, if these uh, new charged particles uh, exist and they're very, they're very well, you know, they're too heavy to be observed at the LHC thus far. Um, effective dark matter photon interactions may give us a nice picture or an, uh, a better picture on what the uh, what the possibilities are. Okay, and so that was the, that's the motivation of our, our work. Um, so we consider dimension we consider dimension five and six effective operators between the photon and a fermionic singlet, which here plays the role of our dark matter. Um, the F here is the electromagnetic field strength tensor. And here we have the, the classic uh, uh, magnetic electric dipole moments uh, for, dimension, for dimension five interactions and the charge, what's known as the charge radius and the anapole interactions or effective interactions. Um, as the uh, at dimension six. I kind of, in this talk, I interchange between chi, which is the Majorana dark matter, and psi, which is the Dirac dark matter. Um, we choose the normalization so the constraints are the same for the anapole, um, or for the Majorana case, uh, which is also, it's interesting, I wanted to point out that um, for me personally, the anapole is, uh, is kind of the most interesting because in some cases it's the hardest to constrain. Um, because uh, dark matter annihilations are um, velocity suppressed. Um, so you can evade um, uh, direct det indirect detection limits uh, pretty handily. Um, also it's uh, spin dependent. So direct detection uh, constraints can also be uh, weakened. And you have the uh, kind of a nice reason why, why up to dimension six, uh, this is the only operator connecting your chi to your dark matter to the photon um, because, and that's because um, this is the only non-zero one other than the four fermion operator um, at, uh, um, that's non-zero uh, due to uh, Lorentz and Rhodes. Okay, before I move on, I just want to recap EFTs a little bit. And as we all know, if effective field theories are incredibly useful everywhere in physics. Studying them helps you focus on the relevant degrees of freedom. Here I put the classic um, Fermi EFT. Um, 
and they provide also they also provide a systematic prescription for searching for, for and constraining new physics. Uh, what you do is you build uh, operators at a higher dimension. Each dimension introduces a mass suppression. Here it's lambda. Um, and this picture, you know, as a reminder, only works if the processes you're studying are sufficiently below this lambda. Okay. Um, one of the other tenets, uh, basic tenets of uh, uh, effective field theories is that, you know, you, you build your higher dimension operators using the symmetries of the low energy theory. Okay. So at colliders, you use uh, the standard model gauge symmetries and indirect detection, you, use, uh, you can use uh, Galilean symmetry, right? And in this study, we, we combine everything, well, we combine collider and direct and indirect um, searches. So you might remember only a couple of slides ago that I introduced uh, the coupling with the photon um, via the electromagnetic field strength tensor. But you know, or, and from the last slide, I said that I should use uh, I should build my operators with um, fields that uh, respect the standard, respect the uh, uh, symmetry groups um, of the processes that you're considering, which are relevant to the processes you're considering. So you would be correct in saying that we should really be using the hypercharge uh, field strength tensor to couple the, the photon uh, to your possible dark matter particles. Um, Basically, in, in like historically, I mean, the, the reason why people often uh, have considered F mu mu um, is because when these moments were first introduced, as I'll show in a little bit, um, is basically um, they were considering them in terms of direct detection experiments. And direct detection experiments, um, these two um, field strength tensors are. Um, are equivalent up to some Cos Weinberg. Um, so it's often considered a choice whether you whether you consider consider the B mu mu or F mu mu. Okay, uh, this talk hopefully will convince you that it's not really a choice, um, uh, and it has implications for the phenomenology. Ooh. Cool. So as I mentioned. You know, this has a these these moments have like a kind of storied history, and I just wanted to um, kind of show these 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 papers here to, to sort of say that um, that you know there are many notable works, um, and from very early on, people started considering the relic density calculation and not just uh, direct detection um, searches um, and also indirect searches uh, with. Uh, masses of dark matter going up to 10 TeV, right? So, you know, already alarm bells should be ringing. Um, and just to mention here that the 2012 Anapol paper uh, hesitates to go to bring the dark matter mass above the, the mass of the W boson. And we assume it's because they understood that something, you have to be careful with something, right? So if we skip forward um, to last year, um, something that turned me on to this, um, this, this study and maybe kind of uh, motivated me to, to look into this a bit more was uh, this paper uh, by Flores et al. Um, and they were studying basically the VBF signature coming from the triple vertex between two Ws and a photon here. Okay, and then here's my uh, Anapol moment here, the dimension six operator. Um, what kind of uh, interested me the most was that these signatures were, or the, the constraints that they were able to, to to make um, with the VBF uh, topology were, were very impressive. Um, and this is kind of interesting because like I said, the anapole moment is particularly uh, hard to constrain. Um, however, when you think about the slide, the previous slide, um, it suggests that perhaps a diagram is missing in the relic density calculation. Um, so before I had, oh, before I had just the, uh, the Kai Kai goes to photon and to fermions, but now we could also have Kai Kai goes to photon and then W plus W minus. In the same year, Bradley Kavanaugh et al. assert that these interactions are subdominant compared to the photon operator. Um, and to be fair, uh, they only consider direct and indirect dark matter searches. Uh, what I'll show is that it's safe to ignore um, this interaction for direct searches, but it's not safe. Well, you can imagine because they're uh, 
you know, that's not the diagram that, that you see in direct dumb after searches, but also, but, but um, the, the, there are implications for, for indirect uh, dumb after searches. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I've kind of, um, we kind of spoiled the ending already, but, um, but, you know, the question really was, can we ignore chi chi goes to w plus w minus? And uh, if, you, if you take this uh, amplitude and uh, you take the high energy limit, you see some kind of weird behavior already. I've got it here. Um, you see that um, the amplitude goes, uh, grows as s to the four, which is already a bad sign because at most dimension six operators should be uh, growing uh, s to the to the two. And on the right here, I I show the uh, the cross section as a function of mass, and this cross section is just above this like threshold cross section. So it's not the same limit here just to see if this behavior is the same. Um, this is the annihilation cross section just above threshold. Um, so where the, uh, yeah, where it's just um, like near, just above rest mass basically. Um, and we see as soon as the W plus W minus channel opens for the uh, electromagnetic field strength tensor, um, it, it dominates, okay? We can, uh, in the paper, we kind of quantify this a little bit and we show that um, using uh, partial wave analysis, unitarity is violated below the cutoff. So, you know, this, this EFT is really sick for reasons we, we know kind of um, at, you know, at, uh, if this, uh, this, um, at this, these scales like above two, e, two TeV, depending on the Wilson temperature, of course. Um, right, so all of this is to say that we should have just used the solution we already knew and instead use uh, the uh, hypercharged field strength tensor. Okay, so in this case, you also have a Z in the mediator um, and that uh, destructively interferes and it completely cancels off this S to the four growth in the amplitude. And we have something that behaves uh, like uh, we wanted it to. Okay, and now here we, on the right, I showed us five minutes. Yeah. We're 10 minutes to the end. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, here I show the same plot as before, but now our W plus W minus channel is, uh, is completely tamed and it's subdominant. So, you know, can we actually in the end ignore Kai Kai goes to W plus W minus? And the answer is uh, not really. Um, it's true that for, um, for the high dark matter masses, uh, as I showed before, that the, the behavior is subdominant. But uh, in order to solve that problem, we introduce uh, sort of Z physics phenomenology. We have the resonance, we have, um, we have the Z uh, width, and also we have neutrino interactions, which open up, uh, which are, where are they? Um, I think they're the, yes, they're the yellow guys here. And they're, you know, they're, they're not the most dominant, but they're, they're, they're not, not far off. Um, so this, this is kind of, uh, it, this is the main difference coming in. Um, here, so you can't can't completely ignore it. Um, so in the end, we basically we replicate the study by Flores et al. And uh, predictably, uh, now that uh, we include the Z boson, the destructive interfer interference does its work, and our our signatures are like a nearly order of magnitude less constraining. And uh, in the end, it looks like monojet plus met is the best uh, signal to look for. Um, yeah, so we do, we take the CMS, uh, the, the most recent CMS limits and we calculate the bound. We also project for higher luminosity LHC. Um, and I'm just going to flash the results here. We do it for the four operators we consider. Um, and we, we have a discussion in the paper, if you're interested, um, on the valid, validity of these EFTs. And we do some nice kind of uh, stuff with uh, Fisher information and stuff. Um, Right, so, you know, in keeping with kind of dark matter tradition, uh, we, we kind of check what happens with the freeze out calculation and we compare the dot dashed line here, which is the electromagnetic um, field strength tensor. So the incorrect one with the, uh, the hypercharged field strength tensor. And we show that quite, it's quite different um, kind of interpretations can be made if you choose the wrong, the wrong guy. Um, just a little kind of finer point here that that we uh, we we consider EFT um, sort of validity up to 
up to four, six, uh, dimension six, even for the five dimensional five operators. And that's because we include this double insertion. Um, usually you can, or well, often in EFTs, you can kind of reabsorb double insertions with, uh, with the, um, um, with uh, another operator at that dimension. But in this case, it's interesting because there isn't an, another uh, operator that can, be, can, can do that. Um, so we perform up-to-date um, kind, of, kind of recast of these, uh, these moments uh, with, uh, for indirect limits. And here we see we include um, the, uh, the, the resonance and also we have neutrino experiments which weren't there before. Um, on the left, we go into detail to show this for the charge radius, which is dimension five. And then on the, on the middle and the right, we show the dimension, no, that's dimension six, this one. And on the middle and the right, we go for the dimension five, we just show the most important bounds. Um, so in the end, we add everything together and we include current and future limits or future projections for direct detection. And we see here for dimension five, um, Basically, um, the whole kind of region is um, is uh, already constrained. Well, the whole thermal region, I should say, uh, is kind of well well covered by direct detection experiments. Uh, we see for dimension six much more complementarity between uh, the kind of uh, between colliders and uh, direct detection experiments. Uh, we also see that. Um, that uh, there's a little bit of space for the relic in both cases to still be alive. But I mean, once you do some model building, uh, it looks, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not so optimistic about those cases. Um, it's interesting to note that um, sort of insisting that the, um, insisting that the, um, that you stick with the B field can have uh, kind of, um, uh, can have, um, implications for your light dark matter experiments, right? So now here I show the anapole moment, um, the best kind of current constraints from electronic recoils we have for light dark matter experiments. And um, I show that the Z decay width, the invisible Z decay K width already kind of constrains um, light dark matter masses by overall order of magnitude of our best results. So because I'm running a bit low on time, I'm just gonna leave the conclusions here, or at least say that, uh, you know, there isn't a choice between B mu nu and uh, F mu nu, you have to go with the hypercharge. Thank you very much, Andrew. So we have a question from Yuri. I think I can read it since it's, uh, it's online. Uh, so Yuri is asking, did, they consider, did, did you consider Sommerfeld and non-perturbative effects when calculating the relic density? Um, only preliminarily, I think we, from a kind of, a, this is a, a long time ago now, but I think we, uh, this, we, we got to the point where, where, where we convinced ourselves that they were unimportant, um, but because the, because the, usually for Sommerfeld, you have to have um, the long range interactions um, being relevant and that, that requires your uh, self coupling uh, to be strong enough, and I, I think it, it was, it's not, but, um, but yeah, it's something we thought about, but we sh I'd like to think about more. Um, okay. Just a quick comment. I think you definitely should, especially if you look at the heavy regime. I mean, if you go uh -huh. well above the mass of the mediator, which is, in this case, like hundreds of GV, then it's not, I mean, it's the ratio of the coupling and mass. So um, there you might really get into the regime where they become important. Okay, yeah, I'll go back to the drawing board and have a check. Uh, but it's something we did consider. So thanks. Okay, good. Great. Sure. So um, I'm sorry, we are running out of time for this, uh, for Andrew's uh, talk. So I see that there is a further question from Nepomuceno. So I will suggest that you either send it directly to Andrew or you keep it uh, for our time. More... Yeah, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. Okay, so. great. Thanks a lot, Andrew. So, we now move to Yuri. So Yuri, can you please uh, start uh, sharing your screen? Great. We can't hear you. Great, uh, good. So it's, it doesn't commute like the sharing screen. And, uh... No, unfortunately it doesn't. 
So let's see. So, Wait a second. Thank, thanks a lot, Yuri. So you're going to have a 20 minutes again. Uh, I'm going to give you a warning at 10. Thanks a lot. Okay. So as uh, Gianfranco told us very nicely uh, yesterday, dark matter is the oldest fundamental question of uh, fundamental physics. And um, understanding its clustering properties is really important for cosmology and astrophysics. And on the other hand, understanding its uh, particle nature is really important to go ahead on particle physics theory. And I will show you that very exciting progress is about to happen in the next few years. We know for sure, or we are very convinced that dark matter must be a new particle because we know that it is not made of ordinary matter. We are pretty sure that it's not a Mond-like theory because it really operates on so many scales and those known Mond theories cannot accommodate for that. We also know that it's not made of light neutrino species that we know. So it needs to be something new and anything new has to be produced in a new way in the early universe. So the production mechanism is, on the other hand, a strong handle that we can have on the dark matter theory. The best known and uh, famous, let's say, scenario is the WIMP production, where we have two particles, dark matter, annihilating to standard model particles, and the decoupling of this rate in the early universe predicts a certain annihilation rate for, for the model and gives us the expectation what to expect today for dark matter annihilations. So if I draw a simplified version of the parameter space that we search, we have dark matter mass on the X axis and on the Y axis, we have the interaction rate factor. And we have just from this uh, freeze out condition, a certain annihilation rate that we cannot under, um, let's say we have to stay above that rate. And um, that already excludes a large chunk of this parameter space. And then there are experiments that look for uh, annihilation and for, of dark matter in space that advance on the parameter space from above and from the lighter dark matter side because the number densities are higher there. On the same time, at the same time, we have theoretical considerations of unitarity of cross sections that constrain the space from the other side. And that leaves us with this uncharted territory of this WIMP window that is being um, more and more uh, studied, but there's still a large chunk of this space that is open and that's an entirely different talk that uh, I could give, but I think that there will be tremendous progress in uh, searching this window. But on the other hand, this is not the only mechanism we can think of. The WIMP production uh, freeze out mechanism is strongly motivated by interaction topologies that are more uh, resembling quantum electrodynamics or this kind of graphs that also appear in, in, in supersymmetry very, uh, very quite often. And um, that was very compelling also from the theoretical point of view um, for model building, of course. On the other hand, nature is much richer than just those interactions. We have, for example, quantum um, chromodynamics, QCD, or the low uh, energy versions of QCD and effective theories that describe interactions of QCD at low energies that have different types of interactions. So if we start to classify the interaction topologies more broadly, then for example, there could be a number changing interaction uh, entirely in the dark sector, uh, as suggested by Unit Hofberg and collaborators. They showed that this simple model where we have essentially three dark matter particles annihilating to two dark matter particles could by decoupling from the early, uh, from the, um, then when the interaction decouples in the early universe and sets the radical abundance, then an entirely different um, freeze out condition arises. And that tells us what do we expect from this freeze out condition in terms of the interaction rate of this model. However, since this interaction is entirely in the dark sector, we cannot really test it or it's very hard to test. But also this model needs to have some interaction with the standard model, otherwise the dark sector would overheat itself. So there are ways in the end to access this model. But motivated by the question, couldn't we build a model a priori that um, equilibrates the temperatures of the dark sector and visible sector in such a way that during the freeze out the dark matter doesn't overheat? 
we started thinking with John Beacon about another possibility, namely the interaction where we have a standard model particle that uh, participates in this interaction. So there are two dark matter particles that are essentially converted to one. The one dark matter particle is eaten, but there is another uh, standard model particles that particle that uh, contrib uh, contributes to the reaction, but is not con uh, the, its number is conserved. So it's a uh, it's essentially like a co-scattering cool process. This interaction, when it freezes out in the early universe, also gives us a prediction for the uh, rate that we need to get the correct relic abundance. And it looks a little bit different from the WIM. I showed you this uh, toy plot before for, for the 2 to 2 interaction where the uh, required um, interaction rate was a flat line. Now, here on the right hand side, you see the plot where the dark matter mass on the x axis, the interaction rate factors on the y axis. Uh, it's a um, it's dimension of GV to the minus five. It's not a normal cross section, but this rate factor for a three to two process needs a different dimensional scaling because we have um, an additional factor of number density that multiplies it to get the actual interaction rate. So we see that the prediction for this strength of this interaction scales with the dark matter mass. And that also has to do with the fact that um, the um, number densities that are needed in order to get a rate are, um, so you have like essentially another particle in the initial state. So you have an, an extra power of a number density to get to, to the rate when you compute it from this uh, fundamental amplitude. Now, in this uh, right-hand side plot, the uh, red region is excluded by the over-density constraint, uh, over-closure constraint. So dark matter would be too abundant if we were below that red line. And above that red line, we don't have enough dark matter. So the predicted abundance is reached when we sit on that red line. The natural scale uh, for um, this process is sub GV. And in the case of the scattering with electrons only, we even are restricted to the MEV scale or the sub MEV matter scale. How could we test such models or how could we test this kind of light dark matter models? One possibility that I wanna focus for now is the uh, interaction with electrons. So as we heard very nice, nicely from Tim uh, this morning, um, the Xenon one ton experiment is a very sensitive detector that uh, has measured this most rare process in nature, the uh, Xenon 124 double electron capture interaction and in the observation of the electronic recoil spectrum. In our paper with John, we have suggested that, okay, we could use this electronic recoil spectrum and the very uh, precise determination of it to set constraints on this uh, model of the cosims that we suggested because the interaction in the detector of this topology would lead to more energetic recoils because the kinetic, uh, the mass energy of the, of the dark matter is con converted into kinetic energy and the electron that participates in the reaction gets a mono energetic kick. Like here for 250 kV uh, candidates of dark matter, you would get a 100 kV recoil energies. That allowed us to set constraints on this um, Thermally produced model, but uh, soon after our paper, actually, where um, this uh, plot was made, and we just randomly scanned masses, um, the results by Zeno one ton were announced, and uh, they showed something interesting in this low energy range. And in fact, this access that Tim also talked about this morning is it is possible to explain it actually with this cosine process. And the interesting thing is that um, the excuse me rate that you yes you're ten minutes away from the end of your time. Great, thank you. Um, that the rate that you need is actually in agreement with the rate that you expect from the freeze out of the interaction in the early universe and from the production mechanism. You see that there are also wiggles in the left hand side plot where we fit data, and that has to do with the fact that we also took into account the. Uh, orbitals of the xenon atom when calculating the exact spectrum there. So that is an interesting result, but um, how can we also have another handle on um, this kind of interaction and test this kind of um, prediction in a different way 
except for building a larger detector, which of course is also done by the xenon Anton experiment. But what are the other ways that we could choose? There are and several interesting proposals on the market, for example, using superfluid helium for new detector techniques or materials with lattice defects or superconductors or 3D materials. So there is a rich uh, plethora of experiments that are coming up. They all uh, have in common that they are, will be sensitive to lower um, energy depositions in them. And that is actually key because in this low mass range, uh, the elastic scattering cannot trigger interactions on the xenon one detector or even an xenon anton because of the energy threshold. However, uh, this uh, low energy um, scatterings could be detected by the new types of um, dark matter direct searches. The interaction that we are uh, su uh, suggesting can be connected by this two-loop diagram to give us um, scattering, uh, elastic scattering at two-loop. And then if we um, show what the sensitivity would be by any of those proposed experiments, we can see that even, for example, a superconducting um, experiment with one kilogram year exposure could test the parameter space very efficiently. So that is very exciting progress that is about to come quite soon. On the other hand, there are also astrophysical searches that could be performed. And then I wanted to um, quote this paper by Gianfranco and uh, John, that is uh, from 2007. And there set the first uh, very stringent limit on dark matter interaction or elastic scattering with um, our matter. And um, they constrained it by observing the heat flow that comes from Earth. Namely, if the dark matter was captured, would fall inside to the Earth core, annihilate and, over and heat the Earth, then the heat flow that we observe could be used to constrain the dark matter parameter space. However, uh, this uh, search is constrained uh, at the, around the GV because there uh, the dark matter below that mass would evaporate from the core given its thermal distribution and the low, relatively low scale velocity from the Earth. So we would like to go lower in this um, mass space using celestial bodies. And then the question is what we have to do for that. And one uh, question is of course the escape velocity that needs to be larger. And the other question is, what, do they have time to annihilate actually when they're captured? So when dark uh, matter is captured inside a celestial body and sinks to, the, sinks to the core, there is a certain condition on the annihilation rate. For example, for a 2 to 2 interaction, the typical WIMP result, this interaction rate is around 10 to the minus 30 uh, centimeters cubed per second that is needed to equilibrate dark matter. And that is in agreement with the freeze out condition because the freeze out condition tells a larger rate. But in the end, it's um, hard for light dark matter to be thermally produced um, and still be consistent with other indirect searches in the sub-GV range. But there are other mechanisms that I showed to you. There's this uh, simp dark freeze out process. However, this process is not efficient enough to um, equilibrate dark matter in, in, in the celestial body. But then we showed uh, that in principle, the cosim mechanism with its uh, thermally produced rate is efficient enough to do that. And as a subdominant process in other SIMP models, it's also present and allows us to do the equilibration. So we now can search for low mass dark matter and celestial bodies. So what we did with Rebecca Lean in the last uh, paper is to look at different celestial bodies. And um, we were thinking about neutron stars first, but those are very hard to find. They also um, white dwarfs that are easier to find, but they have a larger uh, background in heat, so they are not such good uh, targets. So we decided to focus on exoplanets and brown dwarfs that are cool targets, but they're also heavy enough to have strong gravitational fields to, uh, to be able to study these light dark matter candidates. So um, also their distribution in the galaxy allows us to study local properties of dark matter, and we could see in principle heating that is position dependent. But that is an extremely exciting topic, but I have to uh, let you hang in there until tomorrow, until Rebecca's talk, who will give you all the details on that search and on this proposal. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Yuri. So we have uh, a few minutes for questions. So if you have any question, uh, you can directly come forward. 
So I don't see anything right now. Uh, so let me ask you a very quick question about the first part of your talk when you were considering those uh, interactions between uh, two standard model particles and three standard model particles. Uh, maybe I missed it, but do you have any um, UV realization for that kind of, uh, of Z3 symmetric or matter? Do you have something? Well, actually, we are working uh, currently on this topic with um, several students and John Beacom, actually. And um, so one that the, the different models of midi that mediate this kind of interaction that could be written down for example a scalar mediator that has a um this z3 symmetry or whether three scalar other scalar particles that then interacts with our standard model particles that would be the simplest one or the other one would be a uh, west amino witten type interaction with a gauged uh, um, global symmetry that also has this kind of uh, Z3 topology that, on the other hand, interact with a vector, and that vector could be either kinetically mixed or you have a local gauge symmetry. So there are possibilities to realize that, and we are working on those models because they are very important to study everything that is more energetic than uh, the freeze out, let's say, like the lighter studies and uh, other higher energy environments. Okay, okay, thanks. Sure, so... thank you for the question. So I don't see, is there any question for Yuri? If we are on time, I yeah. have a, a quick, uh, this is Fabio, hi Yuri. But maybe, maybe I'll give it to Rebecca, I don't know. I, I still haven't gotten a feel about how, what about the evaporation of such like particles, but maybe, maybe I'll bring it to Rebecca tomorrow. I, I don't know how, as, as you put it. I mean, the, well, the evaporation is the computation between the escape velocity and the thermal velocity that you have in the core. So if you look at the no, no, old, no, not uh, thermal velocity. The right. core needs to be formed first. So the particles are captured by the halo by losing energy from the halo. They're coming with a right. velocity, which is the velocity of the halo, which is above the escape velocity. There's low down by multiple scatters. And then there is a possibility that they are upscattered by a scatter. That's basically the reason why you don't have hydrogen in the Earth atmosphere, because it's typically lighter and therefore it gets upscattered. So typically in a star like the Sun, particle 4 GeV are up below 4 GeV. There, there's no dark matter particle below 4 GeV cannot be captured by the Sun because they get all upscattered. Um, yeah, but it has to do with no, the no, no, temperature you have, you have and the gravitational scale. I know. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe maybe I'll bring it to Rebecca. I don't want to slow down the session, but uh... mm -hmm. so the key is again to choose choose the correct object. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you have performed this explicitly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that's all. Then and then then I'll bring the details to Rebecca. Thank you very much. Great. Thank okay. you for the question. Okay. So I think we can move on. Thanks a lot to Yuri again for the very nice talk. Thank you. And uh, okay, so we can move on to Peter. Hello. Um, Hi. Nice I'm seeing you. I'm hearing you. Okay, and now I'm seeing yes. your presentation. Right. Great. Then uh, you're gonna have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna give you a warning at 10. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk. I hope to uh, visit Brazil when it's safe to do so. Um, but today I'm gonna talk about this paper. Uh, I wrote with Human and David a few months ago um, about uh, how light fermionic dark matter can actually be. And this led us into a number of investigations in other directions than we sort of initially intended. Um, so this is my generic slide about what we know about dark matter, but I'm gonna focus on the things relevant for my talk and, the, and this paper. So of course we know lots astrophysically and gravitationally. We had a lot of great talks yesterday uh, and I'm not gonna repeat any of that. As for its particle nature, um, the coupling to the standard model or to itself, we've, there's, there's a lot of interesting models, but it could well be zero uh, other than gravity. Um, but as for the mass of dark matter, we actually have an upper limit and a lower limit, which I think is really cool because in some sense that means we have the poorest measurement ever made, but, it, but there is a window here. Um, you know, if it's heavier than I would say 100 solar masses, there's tidal disruption effects um, that are pretty inescapable. And then on the other end, lighter than around 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, uh, is is a you know pretty problematic as well. Um, so this is kind of the the window that I'm starting with here, 
And then there, there was a very neat observation by Tremaine and Gunn in the 70s in the context of neutrino physics that uh, if dark matter is made of fermions, then it can't be lighter than 100 electron volts because uh, it won't fit into a galaxy. And um, we heard about this uh, just, just about an hour ago from, from Malcolm, which was a very great setup for what I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is the overview. Uh, what I'm going to say is that fermionic dark matter can be lighter than around 100 electron volts, but the relevant limits somewhat surprisingly come from things like the LHC, cosmic rays, black holes, and, and a number of other, uh, basically every other, every other extreme environment we have in the universe. And this naturally leads to the question of how many species of particles are there uh, in nature? So um, the, the basic argument of Tremaine Gunn is that if dark matter is lighter than around 100 electron volts, it won't fit into a galaxy. There's, they present two arguments for this. One is if you start with a thermal population from, from however dark, your dark matter is produced, uh, it won't necessarily go into the lowest momentum states. Um, and then there's another argument, which is even if you do get them into the lowest momentum states, the Pauli exclusion principle says they have to stack up in momentum space, space and they will escape the galaxy. We focus more on number two because we are interested in this, uh, in this paper and in this talk about uh, late time constraints. So we're assuming that someone can produce this in the early universe somehow. And we have a model for that, but I'm not gonna go into that here. Um, and while this you know, treatment from the 70s was a bit simplistic, it turns out that they got the numbers pretty much right on. Uh, modern treatments uh, give very similar numbers, 100 electron volts to about 200 electron volts including this one from, uh, from Malcolm and friends down here. Um, so, so we're, we're going to take this as 100 electron volts as the fiducial number. But if you believe a slightly higher number, then feel free to plug that in instead. All right. So how do you evade the Tremaine gun? Well, it's, it's kind of trivial. And I, I feel a little bit silly saying it. But um, it turns out it's important to say it out loud. So the way to evade it is to just have a very large number of species. Uh, so given a, a bound for one species of 100 electron volts, you can go to lighter, uh, you can go to lighter uh, fermionic dark matter if you have sufficiently large number of species. And the scaling is the fourth power. And this is, uh, one of these powers comes from the fact that if dark matter is lighter, you need more species to have the same amount of total matter in a galaxy. And the other three powers come from phase space. And uh, this is because as dark matter gets, or as any particle gets lighter, its effective phase space gets, gets larger by three powers. So you, you can see right away that one electron volt fermionic dark matter is possible. So long as there are 100 million species of dark matter, all with a similar mass. Um, so as I said before, we're focused on late time effects and all the numbers in this talk are essentially order of magnitude. We're, we're dropping factors of two here, but it turns out that um, the story doesn't change very much if you change these things. I'd also like to point out that in this entire talk, I'm not discussing any interactions between dark matter and itself, or dark matter and the standard model that we're putting in by hand. And I'll say what that means in a little bit. So when I, you know, so of course 100 million species seems unattractive and uh, that's, that's a fair assessment. Um, but this is, you know, roughly what we're talking about. Lagrangian with a huge number of copies with the same mass term out in front. But they don't have to be fully degenerate. They can be quasi-degenerate. So for example, if you have some giant you know, SUN group or, or SU square root of N where, for, for an N number of species, you get essentially quasi-degenerate mass states um, depending on exactly how this, group, uh, uh, how this group works. And this was sort of proposed by Lisa Randall and friends uh, in a context of core cusp uh, a few years ago, but they were, you know, they, they were in a very specific context here. You could also imagine something like Kaluza Klein modes, um, where you get a tower of states, and depending on the splittings, you could have a very large number with similar enough masses, although the, the tower of states requires a little bit of care when converting it into this Tremaine gun style bound. Uh, but I'm not going to focus too much on the model. I'm just going to assume that you have a huge number of states with similar masses. And so why focus, why only go to one electron hole? How far can we go? Well, this is not how far you can go, but the, the first thing you would think of is, well, we know that dark matter can't be lighter than 10 to the minus uh, 22 electron volts. Um, and so that means that you can have fermionic dark matter, or it would appear that you could have fermionic dark matter that light, provided that you had at least 10 to the 96 species. Um, this is pretty ridiculous. Uh, that's essentially a Google species, 
Um, uh, and, and there's also some interesting coincidences, which is, for example, a dwarf steroidal uh, for dark matter of a mass of 10 to the minus 22 electron volts has around 10 to the 96 dark matter particles. This is just a coincidence. This is not, um, there's not it's not clear that there's anything deep there. Uh, but this doesn't mean that the scaling law here that I've drawn actually changes slope, but it's not, you, you can't go below that anyway. So the region down here is ruled out. Anything in white is allowed. Okay. Um, but this 10 to the 96 seems like it's too many. I mean, this is more baryons than there are in the observable universe. Uh, for reference, the standard model has around 100 species. Um, but what is going to break if you have 10 to the 96 species? And that's what, uh, that's what we investigated in this paper. Now, it turns out that the things that break when you have this many species don't depend on whether or not the species are the dark matter, even if they're fermions, and even more or less if their masses are degenerate. So um, the main tool we're going to use here is that gravitational is, is gravitational production of these things. So you have some standard model particles going to a graviton going to these dark sector particles. And of course, this is super suppressed from the Planck scale, but if you have a sufficiently large number of species, then you might be seeing this. So since it scales with energy, we thought, let's look at the highest energy interactions that we have, which is ultra high energy cosmic rays. So telescope array and the Pure J Observatory uh, observe the spectrum seen here, and there's a break at around 10 to the 19.5 electron volts. And there's various astrophysical reasons why this could be the, uh, the case, uh, whether it's the GCK process, uh, it could be the end of sources, um, but this is, this is not a ridiculous scenario from an astrophysical point of view. Um, but we can use this to constrain a large number of species because as you dial up the number of species, the branching ratio for proton-proton interaction to go to two dark, two invisible particles approaches one, okay? Which means that as you, as you dial up the number of species or, or alternatively for a fixed number of species, as you increase the energy, uh, extensive air showers would be reconstructed at a lower energy because more energy would be going into the invisible sector. And this would appear as a suppression in the flux. And so we said, well, there is no suppression in the flux uh, below around 10 to the 19.5 electron volts, which is root S of 250 TeV. Um, and so you plug in the numbers and you get that uh, the number of species has to be less than around four times 10 to the 68 for any species lighter than around 100 TeV. So we get this green region over here is ruled out which immediately means that dark matter, fermionic dark matter has to be heavier than around 10 to the minus 15 electron volts or so. Because otherwise you would need to have too many species and this would uh, modify the cosmic ray spectrum. But we can look in other places too, uh, like the LHC. Um, it's not as high of energy, but it's vastly better precision. So Atlas has performed searches for monojets. Uh, and these are scenarios where you have a, a jet recoiling against nothing. And they've detected 245 events with missing energy of more than a TeV. And their theory prediction is for 238. Um, these, these, uh, the, the standard model predictions are mostly Zs to two neutrinos with some initial state radiation of a, of a lepton or quark or whatever, or Bremsstrahlung um, of something. Uh, and that's what, that's what this missing energy recoils against. But graviton to two dark sector particles looks essentially the same. So we use that cross section, we compare it to, um, to the event rates observed and the luminosity that they have collected up through this point in 1711. Uh, we include a three body factor because you need to have not only the two particles produced at the end, but also one standard model particle for it to recoil against. And you get a slightly stronger constraint at around 10 to the 62 species, assuming that uh, the species are lighter than around 500 GeV or so. And that's the blue region. Excuse me, you have 10 minutes till the end of your time. Okay, perfect. Um, there's another constraint, which is uh, black hole evaporation. Um, and this one is, is based on the premise that, uh, you know, so, so astrophysical black holes are not expected to evaporate in any reasonable amount of time uh, that we would be observing. Um, but if you have a huge number of species and they're light enough, they will be produced and black holes will evaporate faster. And so the evaporation rate goes like this here. Uh, it's 10 to the 67 years for a, a, a typical uh, a solar mass black hole, uh, or uh, a little bit longer than that actually. Um, but this is suppressed by the number of species because if there's more species, then it is easier for this to go out since in the standard model, basically only, um, 
uh, photons and possibly neutrinos can contribute to this evaporation. Um, so we can speed up this evaporation as fast as we want by adding in more species. And we make the assumption, and this is a little bit, you know, hand wavy, we make the assumption that for 10 solar mass black hole, like those seen by LIGO, they must have been around for a fairly long time in order for them to have, um, you know, merged into a binary pair and then in spiral. And we, we speculate that this is around a billion years, but you can, you can relax this if you feel like it. Um, and for a 10 solar mass black hole, that corresponds to temperature 10 to the minus 11 electron volts. And based on these uh, approximate numbers, we find a slightly stronger constraint at 10 to the 61 species. And so that's what we get right here. So what this plot is telling us is that fermionic dark matter can go down to here in mass, which is around 10 to the minus 13 electron volts or so, uh, provided that you have 10 to the 61 species. Uh, if it's more than that, you'll run into evaporation problems. Um, you'll also run into LHC problems. If you have fewer than that, you won't be able to pack these fermions into, into a galaxy. Okay, that, that's what I just said. But these constraints, though, um, from the LHC and cosmic rays and black holes don't actually depend on whether or not it's dark matter. So we decided to investigate all other constraints we could think of um, to, to really constrain this parameter space of you know, particle mass and number of species. So what, what other good environments are there for this? Well, we thought of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, the energies are low, which doesn't help our gravitational production so much, but the densities are very high. So you know that seems like a good place to look. Uh, so what happens here is that these new states are populated via gravity in the early universe. And as a very rough uh, estimate of what would go wrong, we don't want the density of these dark states to, you know, uh, be larger than the density of photons. And this implies a maximum reheat temperature. And um, based on what we know about BBN, that this has to be more than, say, 10 MeV, this leads to a number of species uh, limit of 10 to the 63 species. So it's a little bit worse. It's, it's also very bizarre, in my opinion, that all these constraints are coming at it around the 10 to the 62 level, but this seems to just be a quirk of nature. Uh, another environment is supernova, also kind of low energies, but very high densities as well. And we have you know, a, a number of measurements of supernova. And we apply a similar sort of picture here, which is that we know that, or, or we strongly believe that supernova dynamics are governed by neutrinos. And we, and, and therefore we do not want more dark sector particles being produced than neutrinos, because that seems like that would cause a problem. Um, and so just by comparing these cross sections for production, uh, you can get a constraint on the number of species as a function of the Planck mass and G Fermi. And this is slightly weaker at 10 to the 66 species and less than say 100 MeV, above which these species wouldn't be produced in a supernova. But I strongly suspect that a more careful supernova analysis could yield a stronger constraint here. Okay. Um, now there's other constraints, and actually there are, uh, as people may know, there are certain mass ranges that are disallowed uh, just for a single species without even this crazy very large number of species, and that comes from super radiance. Um, so, so we can see there's a constraint here at one species, and and what happens is if you have in, in this case, I'm looking at bosons. I'll talk about fermions again in a minute. But if you have a boson with a mass in these ranges, this will cause uh, black holes to spin down uh, relatively quickly. And since we measure black holes, uh, a number of them with very large or close to maximal spin, then we believe that they could not have been spun up astrophysically faster than they would have spun down if there was a boson of this mass. Um, now, there are some caveats to this, one of which is that if these bosons have sufficiently large inter, uh, self interactions, the cloud that forms around the black hole will self interact and prevent production. Okay, so there's a little bit of care here, but again, I'm focusing on a scenario with no interactions. In general, my, my imagination is that if there isn't such an interaction, there's other probably easier ways to look at for these particles anyway. But as we increase the number of species, now even if you're a little bit off the resonance region, so for example, this. This band right here comes from uh, the observation of M87 star. If you're below that in mass, the production rate of this cloud or the spin down of the black hole is not fast enough to happen. But if there's a large enough number of species, then it will be. And so this scales like mass to the minus ninth power and that's why we get these diagonals. Um, on this side, it's not exactly a straight line. Uh, it actually is a little bit more constraining, but 
we conservatively take it to be a straight line. This region on the right comes from stellar mass black holes in the 10 to 30 solar mass regime. This region in the middle comes from supermassive black holes around a million solar masses. And this is M87, which is around a billion solar masses. Okay. Now this only applies to bosons um, because when this cloud forms, as I said, you get feedback again from the Pauli exclusion principle. And that's, this is yet another, this is another environment where the Pauli exclusion principle acts as essentially a force um, you know, affecting particle production. However, if you have enough species, then the Pauli exclusion principle again won't apply. So you can carry out the same exercise, but it turns out that for a stellar mass black hole, the number of fermions that form in this cloud is around 10 to the 77, uh, which means that if you had around 10 to the 77 species, then this Pauli exclusion principle effect wouldn't happen. And so, uh, you know, then, then the black hole would have spun down. So the constraints follow a similar shape. The slope of these lines is different because they're fermions instead of bosons, but the same idea. And, uh, but you have to be above the, the um, occupation number in the cloud. So it turns out these constraints are not um, competitive. Peter, sorry, you, yes. are, you are three minutes away from the end of the, your total time. Okay, um, in that case, I will just very briefly say, there's a number of other constraints relating to strong gravity which suggests that perhaps there's an interesting thing at 10 to the 32 species. Um, these constraints are, there seems to be some confusion in the literature. I'm not really an expert in this, and I'm not going to claim that these, one of these constraints are right and the other one's wrong. So I'm just going to throw this slide up here and, and then move right to my conclusions, uh, which um, I'll just say that, you know, I think this number of species access for dark matter is interesting. Uh, it, it draws connections between a huge number of different probes there's also some sort of coincidence happening at 10 to the 62 or so species. Um, and what we see is that fermionic dark matter can be as light as 10 to the minus 13 electron volts, uh, provided you have a very large number of species. But I think there's a lot more work to be done here in, in a number of different directions. So uh, thank you. I'll take your questions now. Thank you very much, Peter. So we have two minutes for questions. I have one here from Yuri. So mm -hmm. Yuri is asking you, uh, he'd like to know if you consider effects of RG running in particular, on the running of the neutral coupling or running of other couplings at higher loop order? Uh, that's basically the slide that I, I skipped over. Um, so if you want to go over into this, and uh, there's a lot of literature on it, and they say contradictory things. Um, but th what, what this is basically is, is it's, a, it's a running of, of the, the gravitational constant or M Planck. And, um, and exactly how this runs seems to be a bit unclear, as you can see different papers get different answers from this. Um, so this is something in the literature. It's, it's basically a statement on when gravity becomes strong, when the amplitude of a gravitational diagram kind of approaches one. I'm not really sure how to write that down since we don't know how to you know, calculate strong gravity, but some people try to come up with some hand wavy way to do that. You know, it's, that's all I can I say. That but before it even explodes, but thanks for the answer, yes, uh, you might have effects like when it starts turning up, right? Especially you have really low scales of the masses that you consider for the particles. Uh -huh. So then you start have a scaling of the Newton coupling above the mass scale. Yes. I mean, so we looked at deviations in um, the, the, the measurement of G Newton as a function of distance scales. And those constraints are not quite competitive, but actually new precision measurements coming on the horizon soon. I have a backup slide about this somewhere. Um, yeah, so this is a, there, there's some, some links here, which and I'll post these slides online, but um, okay. about precision measurements for G as a function of distance. It ends up being not quite competitive yet. But it's close. Okay, okay, but it's very cool. But yeah, thanks for the answer. Yeah, I'm really sorry. I, unfortunately, I need to cut uh, to cut down this time. And uh, so, if you want to continue the the, the discussion offline uh, in the chat, please go ahead. It's very interesting. So, Peter, thanks a lot again for your talk. Very nice. So let let us move on, Alexis. Hi, I'm here. Hi. And oh, yes, I can see you, I can hear you, and now I can see your share screen. Perfect. We're going to have 20 minutes. I'm going to give you a warning after 10. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, so first I want to thank the organizers for giving me the, the chance to give this talk. 
I'm going to be discussing work I did with Pavel uh, here at Case Western, Clara, who is now at Caltech, and Pavel's students, Elliot and Rui Hao. And I'm going to be discussing uh, these three papers. And also, uh, there will be one more paper coming out next week, hopefully. So what's the aim of my talk? So I want to discuss uh, the phenomenology of minimal gauge extensions of the standard model that have dark matter as a prediction. And I hope I will show you that these theories have to live at the lowest scale and they can be fully probed in the near future by different experiments. So since this is a dark matter conference and I have to go through the evidence for, for, for the existence of dark matter, I will just say that there is um, a strong observational evidence from independent sources going from the rotation curves of galaxies to the, to the fitting of the CMB data. And what I will be talking about is about anomalous symmetries in the standard model that predict a new sector which is needed to cancel out these gauge anomalies. And as part of this new sector, there is a dark matter candidate in the theory. So this new symmetry breaking scale has to be low in order to be in agreement with the, with the cosmology. And furthermore, there are new CP violating interactions. So therefore the, the, the theory can be complementary tested at the LHC in dark matter experiments and in EDM experiments looking for CP violation. So the symmetry I will be discussing is one which is already present in the standard model as a global symmetry and that's barrier number. So we call here U1B. And I will be discussing, you know, the dark matter pheno, the LHC and, and EDMs. So as all of you know, barrier number is an accidental global symmetry in the standard model. And it is only broken by non-perturbative effects, namely SU2 incidence. This symmetry is anomalous in the standard model. And here the idea is to promote it to a local gauge symmetry. So therefore there will be a new gauge boson that we call CB. And there is a new scalar that gets a vacuum expectation value that leads to the spontaneous breaking of barrier number. Furthermore, uh, these theories uh, provide a consistent completion of the simplified models of dark matter that have a leptophobic mediator. So in the minimal scenarios, the barrier number is broken by three units. So therefore, this also gives you know, an, uh, an explanation of why the proton is stable. So there is no proton decay in, this, in these theories. And as I mentioned before, there is a need to add new fermions to cancel out the, the gauge anomalies. And specifically, we need to cancel SU2 square cross U1B and hypercharge square cross U1B because these two are non-zero in the standard model, three halves and minus three halves. So this is a minimal realization of, of, of this uh, cancellation. And that's by adding Psi L and Psi R, which are two SU2 doublets, Sigma L, which is an SU2 triplet. And then there is Chi L, and Chi L is a standard model singlet and only carries barrier number. This chi L is a neutral fermion and it's automatically stable because after the breaking of the U1, there is a discrete symmetry. So in this sense, we're getting a dark matter candidate for free. There is no need to impose a discrete symmetry by hand. So I think this is a, a nice feature of this, of this theory. So we have a new mediator that's coupled to the quarks. So we can look for digest resonance at CMS and ATLAS. And here I'm showing you a summary of the searches they've, they've done. 
recently. And the point I want to make is that there is plenty of room for a new gauge boson. So, so, so the new C prime can be below the electroweak scale and the gauge coupling can be 0 0.2, can be as large as 0 0.4. So there is no need to, to make the coupling very small for the new sector, you know, to go to 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus four. And besides the diejet production, we also look at different processes of producing a CV and a standard model gauge boson. And the other relevant cross section is the one into TT bar. So once you are above the threshold, then the CV can decay on shell into TT bar. So now let me discuss the dark matter phenomenology. And I will start with a, with a simplified version of the, of the model where there is just the dark matter major and a fermion, the CV, the leptophoic mediator, which is coupled to quarks because quarks carry a barrier number of equal, equal to one third, and it has an axial coupling to the major and a dark matter. So the three parameters for the relic abundance will be the masses, the scalar mixing angle and the gauge coupling. And here I'm showing you the results for the dark matter relic abundance. So I have the mass of the CV on the vertical axis and the mass of dark matter in the horizontal axis. And you can see uh, two different features. The first there is the peak. So this is the resonant, the resonant feature where the mass has to be precisely half the CV mass. But there is also this whole region here that doesn't need to be, uh, it, it doesn't rely on any resonance. So, so, so one doesn't need to find you in the masses. And the most dominant annihilation channel is into a CV and a Higgs. So let me stress once more that this entire region here remains completely unconstrained. Already taking a coupling of 0 0.1. Of course, uh, once we go to the largest coupling allowed by perturbativity, then we see that the LHC digit bounds become uh, very relevant. And furthermore, there is an upper bound on the masses because either the theory becomes non-perturbative or we overproduce dark matter. So everything shaded in blue is overproducing dark matter. And a crucial point of this theory is, is that, you know, this upper bound on the dark matter that usually is, is usually there for, for any WIMP scenario. In this theory, it has the impact of, of having an upper bound on the full theory because all the masses are connected to the symmetry breaking scale. And hence, the upper bound applies to all the all the particles in the theory, including these uh, anomaly char anomaly canceling fermions. So the full theory can 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 live at at a low scale. Regarding uh, direct detection, so this mostly depends on the scalar mixing angles. So here I'm showing you the different colors correspond to different mixing angles. All points are satisfying, you know, the, the measure relic abundance of 0 0.12. You can see that values of 0 0.1 are already ruled out by xenon one ton. And the dashed blue line corresponds to zero mixing angles. So even when there is zero mixing angle, there is the cross section mediated by the, by the CV, which even though its velocity is suppressed because we have a, a major on a fermion, the xenon anton is going to probe, you know, up to 400 GeV, even though, you know, the cross section is velocity suppressed. Alexis, sorry, you're 10 minutes away from the, your total time. Okay, thanks. So now I will, I will, sh uh, I will discuss, you know, the connection uh, between the dark matter and, and CP violation, because this theory also has CP violation. And therefore, we can look for electric dipole moments of the electron and the neutron to also probe the theory. So in the first two lines, I'm showing you all the Yukawa interactions in the theory. And here I'm focusing on the, on the new charge fermions, so sigma plus and psi plus. And here's the two by two mass matrix that in general has all complex parameters. 
And as we discussed in this paper, there is only one um, invariant, one CP violating phase that will be a physical parameter. Because usually, you know, as you know, what happens is if there is a complex parameter, you can redefine the fields and the phase can, can be rotated away. But here, this combination of parameters cannot be rotated away. And this new CP violating phase is going to contribute to the electron and the neutron electric dipole moments through the well-known two-loop bar C diagrams where the charge anomaly canceling fermions are inside the loop. And this is the result uh, of the calculation. As you can see, the, the electron EDM is proportional to the imaginary part of this CHII, and that's a combination of all these complex parameters. So here is where the complex phase enters in the calculation. And I, I believe this is exciting because the, the ACME collaboration has made some significant progress. They are aiming to measure the electron EDM. They use a beam of thorium monoxide molecule because it has a very strong internal electric field. So they cool down these molecules and they go inside the device where they are excited by a laser and they aim to measure the energy from these excited states. As the excited state decays, and it interacts with the electric and the magnetic fields, therefore giving information about the electron EDM. So the latest result they published was two years ago, and that's uh, that this value here has to be less than 1.1 times 10 to the minus 29 in units of centimeter times unit electric charge. So now I will show you what's the implication for the theory I've been discussing. I'm showing you the mass of the, of the psi fermion and the mass of the sigma fermion. But as I discussed previously, these masses have to be below 40 TeV in order not to overproduce the relic abundance. And now I show you the, the ACME bound and that's everything in orange is already excluded. So the ACME bound is already telling us that these mass parameters have to be larger than 20 TeV. So in this sense, the theory is being squeezed from up and from down. I, I should say that I'm taking the maximal CP violating phase. So if as, as this um, phase becomes smaller, then the ACME bound will become smaller. And they, they expect to, to improve their, their limit by one order of magnitude in the next five to 10 years. So that's the blue dash line that we go all the way up here. So that was for the electron EDM, but I can just replace the electron by the quarks and then use this relation derived in this paper using QCD sum rules. And this will give rise to a neutron EDM. And that's the blue line here. So you can see that the neutron EDM is larger than the electron EDM. However, the experimental bounds on the neutron EDM are, are much weaker. They're, they are at 10 to the minus 26. So they are actually uh, above this plot here. So the ACME bound remains uh, the most relevant one. And uh, we also point out that there is a new contribution from this new C prime. And I had never seen this type of contribution uh, before in the literature, maybe I, maybe I miss it, but the C prime can also be, since this is coupled to the quarks, then we can replace the C boson by the CV. Nonetheless, um, here I'm showing you the contribution to the neutron EDM from this new contribution of the C prime. And that has to be less than 1% just because you know, the mass of the CV is uh, much heavier and the coupling is smaller than the weak coupling in the standard model. So just to wrap up, so I discussed you know, promoting the barrier number to a local symmetry and that predicts a new sector. And as part of the new sector, there is a neutral stable fermion that, has, that, 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 that it is a, a good dark matter candidate. 
not overproducing the dark matter relic abundance gives an upper bound on the full theory. There is LHC phenomenology. So we are finishing a paper on studying the phenomenology of the second Higgs, the Higgs that breaks the U1b. And furthermore, there are new sources of CP violation that lead to large electric dipole moments. So experiments such as ACME and future experiments that use polyatomic molecules could fully probe the predictions for the, for the electron EDM. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Alexis, also for staying perfectly in time. So I didn't receive uh, any question until now. So uh, I would suggest if anybody has any question, please come forward. So in the meantime, uh, while we wait for questions, may I ask you to go back to the slide in which you present your modem? I, I got a bit lost. Uh, this one. Uh, the, the next one when you have, when, when you have the, the, yes, this one with the quantum numbers. Okay, I see. So, uh, okay, so sigma is a scalar. So all of them are fermions. So there are four, four, four new fermion representations that, that cancel out the, the gauge anomalies. So okay. they go inside so the loop. Need four of them uh, to cancel out these anomalies. Yeah, so that seems to be the least, uh, the smallest number of representations needed. I see, I see. Okay. There are other scenarios with six representations uh -huh. that can cancel out the anomalies. Okay, thanks. So I see that uh, Andrew has a question. So you have uh, three minutes, Andrew. <laughs> okay, uh, it's only a short question. Hi Alexis, nice talk. Um, could you uh, could you explain again? Maybe I missed it. Maybe I'm missing something basic. Um, like why the dark matter uh, candidate is stable automatically? Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for the question. So the the main reason has to do with with the variant number it has. So so the, this chi L, the neutral guy, is has a variant number of minus three halves. So after the, the, the local U1B is broken, then we have a guy, the lightest guy in the new sector carries by a number of, of three halves, and there is no way it can decay into quarks. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Just, just because, you know, quarks carry one third of our number, and there is no coupling between them that, that will allow them to decay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So I don't see... Any further questions? So I would suggest uh, if anybody comes up uh, with uh, any question for Alexis, please uh, contact him directly in the chat. I, and if we have time at the end of the session, we will resume uh, this question time. So Alexis, thank you very much for the nice Thanks. talk. So we can move on now, Mateus. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can see you. Okay. Let me, let's see if we, okay, I can also see your, uh, your presentation. And the Great. cursor? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's perfect. Okay. So you're going to have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, I'm going to give you a warning after 10. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Enrico. Uh, I also want to thank the organizers for this opportunity. I think I'm not alone in daydreaming about the beautiful time that we could be having at the beach in Brazil but uh, maybe next year. So I'm a postdoc at Minnesota and uh, I will skip the introduction. We've heard a lot about dark sectors, some of the history and motivation to consider them from Patty yesterday, but I'll focus mostly on the neutrino porto option here in this, in this talk. And um, this may or may not have connections with the dark matter puzzle but to me, this is motivated mostly by neutrino masses. Now, if we consider the neutrino porto and we do find some new heavy fermion coming from this dark sector, uh, it is very likely that we'll be staring at a new fundamental scale in nature coming from these Majorana mass terms. Um, another interesting possibility for these heavy neutral leptons is that they have a life of their own in a dark sector new forces, they may be subject to new symmetries that are not shared among standard model particles. 
Uh, and, and in that way, they can have interesting consequences for other problems like the dark matter abundance or on the more speculative side, which is something I will focus on this talk on experimental anomalies. If that's the case, then we can also search for them and their partners in the dark sector through the vector or scalar portal. So I'll work under this framework in this talk. Um, the main motivation for me will be the miniboon excess. So for those who have not heard about the miniboon, this is or was an experiment at Fermilab. It gave almost 20 years worth of physics and it still continues to put out results. So we saw new results in June, strengthening and excess of electron-like events inside of their detector. Um, I think by now, uh, there is no statistical doubt on the, on the success. It is there, uh, but uh, the question is, what is it due to? Is it um, poorly understood systematics or new physics? Uh, the reason one would suspect systematics and backgrounds uh, is because the excess peaks at low energies and has a relatively flat angular distribution, uh, which means that it's mimicking many of the very challenging to compute backgrounds in this experiment, namely single photon production and pi zero production. Nevertheless, uh, I wanna emphasize that Miniboon is an inclusive experiment in the sense that any one of the topologies here on the right uh, can mimic this signature. So it could be due to genuine electrons that are being produced by new E neutrinos inside of the detector, or it could be due to single gammas or boosted plus and minus pairs. Now, as a phenomenologist, uh, I will be aware of the complications of the background modeling, but I also put my creativity to test and, and try to explain this with new physics. Um, I won't spend much time on the oscillation interpretation of this result, which is, I think, the most standard way that the community has, has looked at this success in terms of new physics. It is interesting due to its connections to other short baseline anomalies, but I think it's safe to say at this point that is in severe tension with existing new mu disappearance data, up to some small caveats, uh, and is therefore excluded. Um, that means that people have decided to look into more exotic scenarios, so move away from oscillations and consider dark sectors in neutrino scattering, in the neutrino propagation, or in new states that are produced in the beam. Um, in particular, I'll focus on these realizations here. This is a list of, of explanations that I took from Pedro Machado's slides from Neutrino 2020. <clears throat> and that means that we'll focus on new physics that is related to neutrino scattering itself. So there are new states being produced by neutrino scattering inside of the detector. Um, the way this works is that new mu's, which are the predominant population of this neutrino beam, will upscatter into some new state N, a heavy neutral lepton in this case, through a new force. And N, because of this new force, will also decay very quickly into E plus and minus plus missing energy. And for all of the rest of this talk um, can be understood simply by, by invoking this signature here, where we're saying that heavy neutral leptons have new production modes, as well as a fast decay mode into a plus and minus plus missing energy. Uh, this possibility was first proposed by one of the organizers, in fact, uh, Bertuzzo et al. here where they look at a light dark photon scenario explanation of the miniboon excess. You can see uh, the neutrino mixing parameters involved in this cross section that you need are very small. So there are no tensions with uh, new mu disappearance, for instance. Uh, and they, they were able to identify this region to explain the energy spectrum of the excess. Uh, around the same time, a different group looked at the off-shell mediator case uh, where the Z prime is heavier. And this turns out to have some advantages for the angular spectrum, but some disadvantages in order to get the N state to decay fast enough, as it is now a three-body decay. Uh, so motivated by this story, uh, together with Asli, a student from Durham, and Silvia Pasquale, uh, we worked on a very minimal but renormalizable model for this kind of dark neutrino sector. 
uh, which realizes, in fact, all the three portals that I was discussing in the first slide. So the setup is very simple. There's just a new U1X in the dark sector. This is a new gauge symmetry uh, broken by a new scalar phi, uh, which may or may not mix with the Higgs. Uh, and it's broken at the GeV scale. Now the fermion sector is such that I have a completely sterile state, which mixes with standard model neutrinos, as well as a Dirac-like pair state of dark fermions charged under this new U1X, uh, which mix with N through the new scalar. So this allows light neutrinos uh, in the standard model to mix with uh, U1 prime charged states in the dark sector. Interestingly, um, we already get neutrino masses from this um, seesaw-like model. Uh, then there's some, I won't have time to get into the details of this, but there's some interesting remarks to make. First, that uh, we get contributions at tree level coming from the mass of this dark fermion nu d, which I'll refer to as a dark neutrino, uh, as well as from loop contributions which are proportional to the mass of the sterile state, but are coming from corrections due to the dark bosons in the dark sector. So there's an interplay of, of, of dark sector contributions and lepton number violating uh, scales here. Uh, the, the one crucial aspect of this model is that they will come with many generations of heavy neutral leptons. So just like in the standard model, taus will decay to electrons and muons, here, N6s will decay to N5 and N4 and so on. So one can expect intergenerational fast decays through the new force uh, into also standard model particles, E plus and minus, for instance. So this is realizing fast three-body decays. Um, so this is our prediction for the Miniboon uh, excess. So here on the left, you see the shower energy. Uh, so the, again, peaking at low energies. And this is our prediction in, in solid histogram here. You can see there are both predictions from upscattering into N5 states as well as N6. And what's taking the missing energy away from this signature is no longer a light neutrino, but the lightest of the dark states here being the N4. Um, one can speculate the, the possibility of N4 being dark matter, but I won't get into that. Uh, we didn't study that much in detail, but that's uh, an intriguing possibility. Um, but now going back to the mini boon, uh, shower angle prediction in this model is also very forward. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, we will consider very large kinetic mixing. So the only contribution in the scattering is through uh, scattering through a vector like particle with the nucleus. And typically this tends to be less forward for weak scattering, which has axial vector components but in this case, it's purely vectorial. Uh, this contribution can be more isotropic uh, if we model nuclear effects and add higher Q squared scattering regimes. But with the modeling that we have at the moment, this is the best we can do. Uh, so you can see here the other parameters of the model. So just to specify that the Z prime that is mediating these scatterings is of order GV scale. Thanks. You still have 10 minutes until the end of your talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now, independently of the model that it's producing these plus and minuses from uh, HNL decays, uh, we also identified other signatures that can be directly searched for in neutrino scattering experiments. Uh, the first one with collaborators Carlos Arguez and Yudai Tsai, uh, we pointed out that, especially for the light mediator cases, one produces a lot of single photon like signatures inside of the neutrino detectors. This is just a, a statement that overlapping E plus E minus states or boosted E plus E minus states mimic photons inside of, of, of neutrino experiments. So here, one should keep an eye out for NOVA and MINERVA measurements of the neutrino electron scattering rate. Another intriguing possibility was uh, double vertices, uh, which is uh, neutrino scattering followed by a microscopical lifetime of N with a decay. Uh, and you would get two vertices inside of the detector. Uh, we actually found that the last experiment to do a HNL search in this way for two vertices in the 90s was CCFR, where uh, an excess was observed. Uh, this is 
not the statistical effect. This is uh, uh, the statistics here is solid, but the problem is again the backgrounds. Uh, this success has not been explained with any known backgrounds that we know of to this date, um, but it has not been talked about as often because one would expect charged current uh, decays to the HNL as well as neutral current in the minimal models. This is the reason why uh, it's been um, kind of left behind a little bit. But we point out that in these dark for, dark, uh, HNL plus dark forces model, one does not necessarily have a charged current decay and a purely neutral current, neutral current signature is purely compatible with these, uh, perfectly compatible with these models. Okay, so going away from um, neutrino experiments, there's also interesting things to point out about the mediators themselves. One is to revisit the muon G minus two anomaly. And in the most minimal invisible dark photon scenario, this possibility is excluded, uh, but only by a single experiment at the GV scale. And that's uh, Babar looking for single photon signatures recoiling against a large missing mass. Now, the point is that in our model, this Z prime is not invisible, but it's also, also not fully visible. It decays into visible stuff plus missing energy. So if this visible stuff is being vetoed in the single photon analysis, what is also not being reconstructed as a resonance in the visible search analysis, and these relaxes this collider bounds. And we found that for a one GeV, there's the possibility to explain the G minus two anomaly uh, and relax the Babar bound to, to a reasonable degree. Um, of course, this is a gigantic kinetic mixing. So end production still takes place, uh, but has never been dedicated, no searches have been dedicated to this kind of final state. But we note that if one of the ends decays into E plus E minuses inside somewhere in the calorimeter, it fakes a photon signature. And that produces fake monophoton signatures like the ones that were being searched for at Babar. Now these fake signatures do not have a bumpy like structure and a specific missing mass, but they're rather more uh, evenly distributed. And we found that there's actually a little bit of a constant excess in the data in this uh, sample, nothing to be super worried about, but at the level of two sigma, there is a preference for signal, 50 signal events coming from these pseudo photons over just background uh, hypothesis only. Uh, finally, I wanna point out a very important uh, probe of these dark sectors, which is K on the Ks. These are well-known probes of dark uh, new states, and this is no different for this HNLs. So on top of the usual searches for charged lepton plus a missing mass for the HNL in, what these models are predicting is that HNLs are decaying inside of the detector into E plus E minuses. Now what one can do is to apply the peak searches and look for a potentially displaced E plus E minus vertex. So the, for the benchmark point of minimum that I was discussing before, there we expect order 3000 events in existing NA62 data. So this can be searched for. Even more interesting is the case where the light, where the Z prime and the dark photon is not heavy as in the case we're considering, but it's actually light. Uh, this was considered by Bertuzzo et al. at the beginning there, uh, I showed you the plot. And in that case, the game is even more interesting because not only can I look for the invariant mass peak of the HNL itself, as a missing energy uh, peak, but I can also look for the invariant mass of the dark photon. So this is a, a two-dimensional plane of, of invariant mass of E plus E minus versus missing mass um, of N, and you would see a bump as a single point in this, in this two-dimensional parameter space. Uh, this can be searched for with existing data in A62, and we're looking forward to these results. Um, Finally, in the last few minutes, I just want to advertise some work that is coming out tomorrow. This is in collaboration with Maxim Pospolov. And before we were considering K on the case to three charged leptons. But uh, the point here is that one doesn't have to stop at a single E plus E minus production inside of the, of the detector. 
And that dark sectors, and we also consider MEV scale action models, can produce multiple charge leptons inside of the detector for relatively cheap price in terms of new physics couplings. And we've identified two PK channels, um, and there are more in the paper if you're interested, that have never even been calculated in the standard model and or even searched for akin factories. Uh, and that can probe and that can have branching ratios that exceed of order 10 to minus eight and 10 to minus six. So keep an eye out for this uh, and just bear in mind that uh, these dark sectors can produce multiple uh, charge left on final states. So with that, I leave you with my conclusions. Um, we considered HNLs as part of a rich dark sector. We saw some novel interplay between the portal couplings and we saw the neutrino masses can also be sensitive to the presence of these dark gauge symmetries. Uh, we explored the possibility to explain mini boon, mion G minus two, and neutral current vertices at the CCFR, and showed some future prospects to test the model. So with that, uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mateus, for the very nice talk. So we have uh, a couple of minutes for questions. So let's see if anybody comes forward. Please, if you have any question, uh, you can ask, ask it directly to Mateus. Okay, so maybe while we wait, uh, would you go back uh, to the slide uh, in which you were showing uh, the upscattering of, um, not the upscattering, uh, the, the, that one, next one, next one, this one, the double one. one, yes. So did you check, did you guys check uh, whether these, uh, the, the, the parameter space in which you can accommodate nicely mini boon can also explain this excess, explain this excess. The CCFR one, you mean? Yeah, the CCFR one. Yeah, so um, we did a check where we estimated the DIS cross section because this mm -hmm. is essentially what's coming into the scattering process for CCFR because these are much larger energies. Yes. Uh, and for the lifetimes that uh, we're actually constrained from other processes that I didn't really mention here in the talk. We checked that for those lifetimes that we had already chosen, uh, you could explain the typical gaps that we're seeing um, in CCFR. So the normalization rate is compatible, although we didn't do a full analysis of the experiment. And the separation gap between scattering vertex and the K vertex was also compatible. Nice, yeah. very nice. Okay, so I don't, uh, I don't see any further questions, so. I mean, I'll be around if people have other questions, they can send me on the chat. Yeah, or, or we have, uh, so maybe it's better since uh, we have just uh, 30 seconds left. Uh, okay, so I, uh, Mateus, thank you very much. Thank you. No. Again, so if you have, uh, if any of you have questions, please uh, send them directly to Mateus, he'll be around. We move on. Thanks again, Mateus. Yeah. So next speaker is going to be Martin, Martin Bollmann. Yeah, hi. OK, hi. So I can I, see you. So you can see me. You probably see already my. And I can see the presentation. Yeah, and I will uh, activate the, the pointer. So if you see my pointer probably already. Yes, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, okay. okay. So we're going to have uh, 20 minutes, uh, Martin, after 10 minutes. Okay. I... That's nice. Okay. Uh, so thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Martin Vollmann. And uh, yeah, I would like to spend the next uh, 15 minutes uh, plus five uh, talking about my, my latest uh, work. Uh, here you, you see it. Uh, came out uh, last week, it's my first single author paper, so I'm very proud of it. Um, so in case you haven't seen it, uh, so please don't miss it. And uh, this is on, um, yeah, the development of uh, theoretical tools for uh, searches uh, uh, for dark matter using, using radio. Uh, so since I'm aware that uh, many of you are not that familiar with this, uh, uh, messenger with the radio as a messenger for dark matter detection. 
so I thought I, I could uh, uh, put you in some context. And, and so, yeah, as, as you probably do know, uh, uh, dwarf galaxies are, are very good objects uh, to search dark matter with uh, because they're uh, dominated by dark matter. And uh, yeah, so if you have, uh, for instance, uh, WIMPs, uh, the WIMPs uh, particles, they, they will annihilate it inside the dwarf galaxy. They will create electrons and positrons. So it will dump uh, these electrons that uh, then will eventually uh, lose their energies by uh, yeah, the interactions with the magnetic fields there. And uh, this, uh, uh, so they emit uh, radiation, as you know, this uh, synchrotron radiation that you can capture uh, by your telescopes and, and this line, the radio band. Uh, so we have a problem. And, and the point is that uh, uh, the theoretical predictions are very uncertain. So on, on the left-hand side of the plot here, where you see my cursor, so uh, you see the results uh, by Fermilat. Uh, on the, so the limits that the Fermilat can uh, put on uh, the dark matter model here, the PB bar particular model. Uh, as a function of the dark matter mass. And uh, in this uh, lower panel, you see the theoretical uncertainties that is around 10% uh, or the one uh, in the uh, most pessimistic case. But uh, on the right hand side, so you see the results of a paper that I put out uh, with the collaborators from, from LOFAR of the observatory. And uh, so, so you see that the uh, uh, uncertainties span several orders of magnitude. Uh, and well, so uh, the, the point is that, uh, so this unfortunate, of course, and, and, and the reason is that this uh, depends strong on, on the magnetic field. And we have not observed any uh, uh, magnetic field in any uh, dwarf galaxy. And, and so now I, I, I quote uh, Gianfranco Bertone, so absence of evidence is not the same as uh, of evidence of absence and uh, we we have evidence that this uh, magnetic field existed uh, uh, because uh, uh, there was star formations we see the stars that there uh, right now and in principle uh, this uh, th these magnetic fields can be uh, relatively large so the the point is that is they are very difficult to detect and so it's not clear how many dwarfs uh, galaxies from the classical dwarf galaxies in, in, our, in our galaxy, in, in the Milky Way, uh, were able to store their magnetic field uh, up to a level that, is, that makes sense uh, to, to uh, search for dark matter uh, using these uh, dwarfs. So the ultimate goal, uh, so what we dream of is to reduce these uh, uncertainties and this is a task that uh, uh, takes uh, observational work and, and, and theoretical work, of course. So from, from uh, observation, so, so of course, if you carry out uh, deeper and deeper searches for diffuse signals in, in these objects, so you will be able even uh, probably to detect, hopefully, at some point, uh, the diffuse emission. And otherwise, you will be able to constrain the magnetic fields, uh, star formation rates, uh, the sources. And uh, this, uh, uh, in turn, so, so here is you go with the uh, arrow like this. This uh, will allow uh, theories to uh, refine uh, the models and, 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 and get a better picture of, of the, uh, this problem. But on the other hand, so theory can also be useful for observation because uh, uh, so you can, uh, theorists, we can guide uh, the, 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 the strategies that uh, uh, astronomers uh, use. And this is, uh, what we do in, in, in this work. So just to flash you what uh, uh, the results of, of, of my paper. So we develop a new semi-analytical method. Uh, and uh, so we, we were very comprehensive. So we, we discuss uh, uh, many cases and, and we identify regimes where uh, approximations are possible. Uh, then uh, we will also uh, uh, explain the, the prescription, prescription we use to, to get uh, uh, the, the spectra in a very efficient way, to, so numerically. And uh, uh, yeah, as a consequence of, of our uh, results, we, we also uh, uh, guide the, the, the next observation. So we suggest uh, strategies for, for next observations. And uh, I, I should recall that, that these uh, methods are transferable to uh, 
the X-ray community uh, when they are uh, looking for dark matter uh, through the inverse Compton scattering process. So there are, uh, of course, more motivations, complementarity among messengers, and, and that uh, we have uh, enormous uh, collaborations and, and interest. Here is uh, uh, here. These are uh, radio telescopes that have already shown interest and, and worked on, on, on this topic and, and, and shown in uh, chronological order. And of course, we have uh, the SK in the future, so it's a promising future. And uh, well, maybe some wishful thinking. So if uh, we discover dark matter otherwise, say by the CTA. We can use the uh, uh, radio observations to put constraints on magnetic fields. So this would be a very nice application. So as you see, so I, I spent already uh, seven minutes in, in the motivation because I think it's uh, uh, the most important part of, of the talk. Uh, I will. I, I won't go into many theoretical details uh, because uh, this might be uh, not uh, the right uh, time scale to discuss them. But uh, uh, so I, I will just show you uh, what the assumptions are. So the model. Uh, so it's a very simple model uh, for for uh, the transport of the electrons that are done by, by annihilation, for instance. Uh, so you assume that uh, uh, there's a stationarity. You assume symmetrical. Uh, uh, spherical symmetry, sorry. And uh, uh, so uh, then you parameterize uh, the propagation through this uh, uh, diffusion constant, which you write uh, as a power law. So the, the, the index and, and the normalization are parameters. The magnetic field is also known. And also here, the, there is this uh, uh, scale, this length scale that determines uh, or that uh, somehow describes the, the size of, of the diffusion zone in, in your galaxy. Here, for concreteness, we, we are writing the, the standard uh, annihilation, S-wave annihilation of self-conjugate uh, uh, dark matter. But in the paper, we consider decaying dark matter and, and all kind of uh, uh, scenarios. So uh, this uh, equation has an analytical solution. This uh, has been known for a while. So you have to introduce this uh, so-called Sirovsky variable that has units of length. Uh, uh, so far uh, in the literature, pe people have considered this uh, uh, formula. Actually, I, I corrected it in, in my paper, uh, which is a superposition of uh, heat kernels. Uh, but uh, in my paper, I focus on, on this representation in, in terms of Fourier modes. Not here that the Sirovsky uh, variable appears in the denominator, in, in, in the Fourier expansion appears in the numerator. Uh, so in the paper, so all the analytical properties of, of, of this screens function are exploited and, and, and we consider several cases. And, and then, so what I told you at the beginning, there are some regimes where you can uh, find some approximations. So, uh, I'm not going to go into the mathematical details, as I said before, but I just can discuss the physics. Uh, so you have, a, for instance, in this case, A. This case, A, is simply you, you create the electrons by annihilation. The, the electrons uh, are not able to diffuse much, so they, they, stay, they lose most of the energies at the point where they were created. So the regime B is a regime, uh, so it will be clear in the, in the next slide. Uh, so the electrons uh, diffuse and, and diffuse in such a way that, that you uh, uh, lose, uh, lose all the information about where they come from, where they came from. And the regime C, so the, the, the particles, they, they diffuse uh, uh, too much so that they don't have time to, to lose their energy. So uh, these approximations, all of uh, these approximations have something in common. And, and the common thing is that the, the observable quantities are there. So they, they have this uh, uh, very nice formula that you can factorize the, 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 the morphological property of the signal times a spectral uh, function. The spectral function is universal. It's the same for all regimes. But the, the halo function depends on, on which regime you are. So here, so you see this can remind you're 10 minutes away from the end of your time. Perfect. Thank you. 
Uh, so here you uh, so you have uh, uh, something that is reminiscent of, of uh, uh, gamma rays. So the phenomenology of gamma rays, where you have this rho square and the j factor, so, so you can uh, relate to that. Here is what I told you in the slide before. So here you have a universal shape, so something that doesn't know anything about rho. So all the information about rho is in the normalization. And okay, in the regime C, you have something that's a bit uh, more complicated. Uh, so the results, so, so you have a, a huge variety. Uh, uh, so I consider limiting cases. So for instance, here is a point mass. So, so it's like a halo. You have a direct delta sitting at the center, and then you you uh, dump the electrons from there. Uh, but you also have the fully uh, fully shallow, so a court uh, profile, and and uh, the the benchmark cases. Uh, also for the spectra, I consider many cases. Uh, but here, so for uh, time reasons, so I take a, a selected example here. So just to show you, uh, so this black uh, curve, uh, dash curve, is, is uh, the regime A. So this is the one I told you about where the electrons stay at the, at, at the place where they were created. And this kind of maximizes the, uh, the flux that you can get. Then uh, the regime C, so you retrieve the single emitter frequency dependent. Dependent, sorry, and, and and these are of course uh, very suppressed. Something that I would like also to mention is that uh, people in the radio community is a bit uh, technical point. Uh, they employ uh, this so-called monochromatic approximation, and and you should be careful in doing that because you would miss all this uh, rich phenomenology of the uh, uh, region C. Uh, so. Uh, obtaining the exact solutions is something that is uh, not expensive at all. So, so it's something that you can do, uh, but it's uh, in the, not practical, as I will show it, uh, uh, right away. Uh, so in this uh, selected example, so I'm showing you the, um, uh, the results of, of uh, the exact result compared to the approximations for, for two, uh, two models. So this is some leptophilic uh, uh, model of uh, uh, 50 GB mass, and, and then you have the, uh, uh, some decaying dark matter, very heavy with electroweak charges. And so, uh, so you see how, for instance, here the blue curve uh, resembles the black one, and here the, the green one, uh, dotted one with the black one. But I'm, yeah, uh, uh, you would like to have some quantitative, quantitative uh, uh, handle on this, so, so you should compare the flux densities. And 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 the, uh, if you want to compare the shapes, you you could uh, you want you will want to use this half flux radius. So the the message here is that if you are uh, if you want to uh, you're willing to sacrifice ten percent of accuracy, then uh, so you might uh, want to use approximated uh, results. So the last point, and and this is uh, uh, closely related with what I just said, is is a strategy to. Uh, uh, for future searches. So no, usually when uh, you do a dark matter search, so, so you pick a model, so you either annihilation or decay, and, and then you you uh, uh, set your branching ratios and so on. Then you model the, the halo of, of your galaxy, and you have two possibilities. So what I call brute force, so you scan uh, all parameters in the model, you have five in, in, in this case in, in my model. So then your dark matter signal will be uh, something, uh, a complicated function of these parameters times the uh, annihilation rate. And uh, so then uh, you should test the model in this uh, five dimensional cube. And this is something that is uh, very expensive computationally. So what we propose is. Uh, uh, using uh, only one parameter, so the, 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 the angular size of, of the signal, uh, uh, because uh, we realize there are many degeneracies in, in the problem. So you just uh, have to parameterize a signal as a normalization times a halo function. You test the model, uh, place bounds on, on this normalization, and then you well, what you have to do is translate it in, into uh, limits on uh, sigma v. Uh, so we also uh, use this formula to make estimates of, of the limits that you, the two sigma limits that you would get if you only have uh, uh, the noise level of certain observation, and, and then you get something like, like this. We also give the ingredients. Then it's just plugging in the the parameters that you get from from yeah, uh, 
kinematic studies of, of, of a galaxy. And then you get uh, uh, so this uh, type of results. So, so I also show uh, several uh, scenarios. And uh, so I compare the approximations with the uh, exact results and also uh, uh, when it comes to the shapes. So, so you see there is always a, a profile uh, a shape that, that uh, uh, yeah, uh, is similar to what uh, you expect. So I go to my conclusions. Um, so uh, I developed an, a new method to, to compute uh, these uh, fluxes. Uh, so using this uh, uh, Fourier mode expansion, identified uh, regimes uh, where you can perform approximations. We uh, computed this for, for many uh, cases. So this, uh, all these cases are covering the paper. And we proposed uh, a new strategy uh, to search for, for the signals, uh, uh, for the radio signals in, in, in these uh, uh, galaxies. Thank you very much, Martin, for the very nice talk. Thank so you. we have a couple of minutes for, for questions. So come forward, uh, just ask them directly if you have them. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't see anything for the moment. Uh, yeah, I guess the participants are starting to be overloaded. Yeah, I have a question. yeah. okay. Oh, yeah, otherwise I, I have some slides uh, uh, that are not, uh, but uh, okay. The slides are on, uh, can you go back to the, the actual constraints currently, the observations? If you can go back to the actual observations. Actual, oh, no, uh, uh, ah, so, okay, you mean the exact results? Because yeah, I, in, this is only prediction. So I, I didn't use any observations at all. So I, I did okay, the so exact, I, mm -hmm. yeah. Excuse me, I didn't want to interrupt you. I would understand, I'll tell you what I understand and I mean, maybe you can correct me. So yeah. this, this you didn't use any actual observation on the no, no, no. And is there any actual observation? No, that's the point. So, so uh, the, we, we haven't observed any uh, dwarf galaxy, any signal of diffuse emission in, in any dwarf galaxy. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is a big challenge, and this is uh, what we are looking forward to. In that, uh, but but we can put uh, we can of course set limits on, on it, dark it matter. Stands yeah. that you, it still stands the fact that you would not expect to see anything from the dwarf because it's basically dead. So there is no other uh, leptonic, leptonic production other than dark matter annihilation. So there is no cosmic rate. So you, you don't expect to see anything unless exactly yeah so so we are assuming that the the, the dark matter is the source of all cosmic rays uh, yeah of course uh, so there is a, a work by marco regis uh, 2014 where you they discuss also uh, scenarios or so standard scenarios where where you have a injection of a cosmic rays from standard astrophysical processes but uh, so so i i I didn't uh, discuss this. This can be, of course, incorporated uh, in, in this framework because uh, so it's uh, here is the, the main assumption here is that uh, the source uh, are, is only dark matter, but you could in principle also uh, add uh, other sources of uh, uh, cosmic electron, cosmic ray electrons, yeah. And I, I have plenty of other questions is that also they can go together with the other speakers. But let, let's probably let's let the session roll on. And yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much then for, for the attention. So thanks a lot, Martin, for the very nice talk. So we, we move on to our last speaker. So Marcos. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Can you see me? So I, I see the top of your head, which I think is, is okay. I can hear you. And now I can see something. Uh, yeah. oh, although I'm not seeing your presentation. Oh, let's miss it. Uh, let's do it again. Oh, it's... 
Now I see your presentation. Yeah, uh, let me try to put e e in full screen now. Yes. Can you see that? Uh, so I don't. I still don't see it uh, full screen. I I see. I see oh. the the program. Okay. Now it's okay. okay. Can you see this? Yes. Now it's okay. So Marcos, okay. you're gonna have uh, twenty minutes, uh, and I'm gonna give you a warning after ten. Okay. Thank you so much, and I'd like to thank you the organizing organizing from this meeting to allow me to present this work. It's, uh, I am starting uh, doing the research on this, on this field. Okay, and I will present the results we have uh, get to, until now. Okay, and uh, okay. Um, here on, on this talk, I will present a, a supersymmetrical version of um, a model presented in 2009 from Montero and Plates. Where on this model, they they consider they they introduce the, the minus L symmetry as gauge symmetry, but you know there are so many models in the literature about B minus L gauge models, but usually in this kind of model they have uh, high ground in neutrinos, but always with B minus L equal one, and now we we expect. If you enlarge the gauge symmetry, uh, allowing a new symmetry, we call uh, this one here, our primer, where the, uh, this new symmetry, the hypercar, the use of hypercar from the standard model is related by this expression. We, we can see what you can get from when you get this new, new symmetry. Okay, and you will. Uh, allow only p minus l to be inter numbers and only the left handed neutrinos will be active. And okay, and you know us that this new symmetry have some anomaly and we need, for example, an analyzing what will happen. Then okay, we, we have in this article, they have done it, no analysis, all these anomalies. And when, and then, okay, with this second assumption, they have found that they can have only two types of model. The first one is, is like the US one, where you have B minus L equal minus one. And the second one, they have two high hundred neutrinos have this, new charge, B minus L equal four. And the third one has this new B minus L charge. And the main motivations to build the supersymmetric version of this second model is that, okay, as, as we will show in, us, in some few minutes, we, have, we get some very nice, good, good dark mark candidate. We can get all, all the neutrinos get mass at, uh, at C-Sol tipo one mechanism. And uh, when you get the, the S-neutrinos mass, you can generate leptogenesis on this, on this kind of model. Then the, these are the main, main motivations to, to consider this, this new model, because uh, as you, so then, okay, on, on, on this model, we put, as we have done in, in the minimal supersymmetric standard model, we put the usual fermions in chiral superfields, where here are the, the, the usual left handed leptons. No, in the green, we put the, this new quantum number, and in red, the B minus L number. Okay, and uh, here are the leptons, here the, are the quarks in doublets. And of, of course, we have uh, the charged leptons in, in the singlets as high hundred, uh, high hundred representations. And uh, we have here the, uh, our, the, the, the two high hundred neutrinos with B minus L equal four. 
and the, the third one, this one here. Okay, uh, as I said, we put all, all the farmers in, in the cural superfields. Now then, okay, here we have the neutrinos, will be represented here. And of course, we have also the S neutrinos. Then on this model, we have it both two. We have left-handed neutrinos and left-handed S neutrinos. And now we have high-handed neutrinos and high-handed S neutrinos. In the scalar, in the scalar sectors, you have as usual in the MSSM, AG1 and AG2. These two scalars, you generate a mass from all the charged jet leptons, the, the electron, muon, tau, and all the quarks. But now you need to put these, these four new scalars. These new scalars, they will break it, the this symmetry, this symmetry from the symmetry uh, for the hypercard from the standard model. Okay, this this uh, from you get from our model to the standard model, and uh, we also need to introduce two new singlets to generate the Majorana mass from the high hundred neutrinos. The, and of course you have the the gauge bosons in the in supersymmetric model we put them in the in the vector superfields and here we, we write the direct expansion in this vesomino gauge now around here we have the gauge bosons the gluons the the s2 gauge bosons O prime and gauge bosons and B minus L gauge bosons. Now here we we have beyond the the the, the charged uh, charged bosons we have the Z the photon Z and Z primes. And of course, as you know, this vector is from this person you know it's a real. They need to imply that lambda and bar lambda are the same. Then okay, we see this. All gold genes are Majorana, are Majorana fermions. And okay, and okay, it, it have a nice uh, impression from the from the neutralinos and uh, and of course uh, neutralinos and gravitino stars. And as okay, as I said, uh, one one this uh, the when we want to get this standard model, we can get a mathematical relationships between the gauge couplings from these new gauge groups with the usual hypercharge. And this relation is given by this relation, where G, G, uh, this G1 is, is the, the coupling constant from the, the, from the hypercar from the standard model. And you know, uh, from the standard model, we can get this, these expressions and getting the experimental constant to get these values. And uh, with this one, know this, and we can get, for example, knowing th this new new G epsilon prime, we can get the, the gauge constant from the B minus L. It's given here in these, these pictures. And of course, as we get all the mass pattern, you can Build the, our our Lagrangian, and the interesting thing is, is here. Now we see that our high hundred neutrino they cannot interact directly with the Z gauge bosons. They can only interact with the new gauge bosons from the new symmetries because it need our weak stereo neutrinos, and they can be good candidates for dark matter. Not, uh, uh, not only the, the high hundred neutrino, but also the high hundred S neutrino can be good candidate for, for dark matter on, on, this, on this model. Of course, this, this two second part, L quart and L gauge, are basically as usual on the MSSM. The, uh, and here, okay, I put only for 
the the part from the scholars and why I'm saying this because from this part we get the our super potentials and in our oh, super potentials we your, get terms like on the standard mo on the MSSCM. This sorry, Marcos, you are 10 minutes away from the end of your time. Okay, thank you. And this here, this you give a mass from the charged leptons. These terms and these terms in red, they you get the direct mass terms from the from the left handed neutrinos. And as I said, phi one and phi two they have a major on the mass from the high handed neutrinos. And as you can see, when you get the mass matrix from the neutrinos, we see first they are major on fermions, and they get mass from the seesaw mechanism tip one. And their masses can be as usual explained on this on these formulas. And of course, when we we'll go, go get the soft terms to, to break this supersymmetry, we see the, here we can write this these expressions. And he, we can see from this one, this term here, with N1, and this here with the two high neutrinos with B minus L equal minus four, we can get mass matrix from the S neutrinos. And of course, it you, you get a new CP violated first that you can write on this way. And of course, with this, we can get, for example, leptogenesis scenarios where the neutrino, S neutrino, can decay in, in lepton and uh, usual, usual, usual scalars. And you write from our superpotentials, given, given here, basically, this, this parameter and these new parameters, we can get this the case that, okay, is. So, where we uh, we are now in our work in, in this, where now okay we can get uh, uh, the mass spectrum from the S neutrinos uh, given here, and with this we, we want to to calculate the branch variation from this decays and see if we can if you can explain the experimental data. And of course, we can expect from some signal from, from this model, from, for example, from LHC. And now we can get a lepton flavor violation signals given, for example, from this, this, Feynman, this, this Feynman plot, where a kick bar going the new neutrinos or new S neutrinos. And of course, this new neutrino can decay, for example, in electron plus muon plus jet and also mix energy. And now in our work, we are in, in this part, okay, for calculated this to try to, to see some cosmological consequences and some, uh, some uh, constraint from LHC. This is what I, uh, I wanted to, to tell here. And I say thanks from, from the organizer to allow me to present this this model and thank you for everyone to watch me. Thanks a lot, Marcus. So I didn't receive any questions. So if anybody has uh, any question, please come forward. So maybe while we wait, I will ask you a very quick question. At the beginning, when, uh, when you were presenting the, the results about the anomaly cancellation, okay. you're taking into account also, so in the two solutions that you're, they, they, they were found, okay. the gravitational uh, anomalies were taken into account, right? Ah, oh, okay, here. Yes. Because I don't see them in the list, but I guess, uh, I guess, they were taken into account, right? Because otherwise the model wouldn't be completely consistent. Yes, then from here, okay, you can calculate the number of, of new high hundred neutrino we can add on this model. Okay, okay, I see. I see. And, and when you, you go to this, the, uh, we, we can put only integral number from, from, L, from the lepton number, we, get, we can have two solutions. We can introduce three high hundred neutrinos three with same numbers, or the second solution with two with p minus l equal four and one with minus five. 
Okay, okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I don't see any questions. So I would suggest if anybody has questions, you can direct them uh, directly to Marcus. So we are at the end of the session. So let me thank so one more all our speaker. It was a very, very nice session. Thanks a lot. So since we are five minutes early with respect to our schedule, I would suggest to try to resume. Uh, uh, I, I have also an announcement, uh, but first of all, uh, let me try. There was a, a discussion between Maria, Malcolm, and Anna. I don't know if you guys solved it uh, privately or, uh, or you I want. like to hear about Anna. Anna had a comment, I think, from. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. Maria. Uh, Anna, Maria, do, do you want to intervene and uh, try to sort out that question? Anna? Hello. Hi, Anna. Hi. Let me so, shut down my microphone. But can I ask you to repeat the question that was addressed to you? Because I think a lot of people don't still don't remember. It was yeah. relative to Malcolm's talk about uh, dwarf galaxies. I'll shut my microphone down. I, so, I, um, so I think Maria's question was whether it was actually a good idea to apply the spherical genes analysis to dwarf galaxies. I think that's correct. Um, so I was just going to bring up, um, in particular, um, Justin Reed's method, graph sphere, that, um, well, Malcolm also used in the paper that he mentioned, but recently I have um, tested the method on dwarfs in cosmological simulations. So we can we actually model the formation of the local group and uh, all the individual dwarfs. So you're taking into account tidal fields um, and so on. And we found that uh, the spherical approximation works very well. Um, I, can, um, I can send you the archive link to this paper. Um, so we just selected a number of dwarfs that were similar in particular to the Fornax dwarf galaxy. And uh, these um, have um, all kinds of different orbits. Um, and on the whole, we found, we found that um, tides, for example, do not um, make much difference apart from the recovery of the density profile in the outer regions. Um, also, in a number of cases, particularly when the dwarfs are aspherical, which we know they are, uh, it's actually um, Kind of part of the method, uh, um, you 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 get out a sort of a statistic that uh, tells you whether um, the model has been a good one. So, say if your dwarf was very aspherical and the method did not uh, return a very accurate density profile, um, say your likelihood or your chi squared for the fit is also very bad. So that that is kind of an indication that things have not gone so well. Um, but on the whole, we found that for these cosmological dwarfs, the spherical approximation works very well. Yeah. I see. OK, so I, I don't know if uh, Maria, are, yeah, you are, you satisfied satisfied with, are you satisfied with the answer? We'll yes. take it as a yes. Yes. <laughs> OK. okay. Yeah. So, so, yes. Can, so you can, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna. So basically, you can apply, so you can assume dynamic equilibrium for this for these dwarf galaxies, and it's safe. This is what you are you are saying, and you have checked that with cosmological simulations. Uh, yes, exactly. So for things like say um, Sagittarius, that would not be a very good idea because we we, we can see Sagittarius getting tidally stripped on the sky. So maybe you might want to avoid doing genes analysis on Sagittarius, but uh, um, we don't see um, also such um, extreme tidal effects on other dwarfs, sculpture or Fornax in particular. Fornax has been a very interesting example for the car uh, for the core cast problem, uh, and so I, I think for those things, genes has been a very good approximation, and we do. Actually, we recover the, the density profiles within two sigma usually very well. Uh, there's definitely room for improvement. So we should really start thinking about taking the asymmetry of the dwarfs into account, et cetera. But at the moment, I think you could be fairly confident that 
genes analysis would return the true density profile within one or two sigma. So okay. especially if you're doing kind of stacked analysis, then um, I'd say it's good enough. You just have to, well, it depends how, how much you worry about your, the size of your error bars. So, so if I understand correctly, from numerical simulations, you take the pseudo observations, you, uh, you apply the genes analysis to the pseudo observations, and you recover the, uh, the profile that you know from the simulation. You, can't, you basically are checking within, and this is in this paper. Yes. So That's we know exactly what the distribution of dark matter is in these simulated dwarfs. Um, and then we just do exactly what an observer would do. So get some um, stellar particles, um, project them along the line of sight, get the line of sight velocities, and then try to recover the density profile from that. And it seems to work pretty well. That's lovely, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Anna, for intervening. So, um, two, uh, announcements uh, and then there is uh, something special from from Martin so the first announcement uh, is that uh, for those of you who are speaking in the next session I am about to make you co-hosts uh, and uh, five minutes before the start uh, of the session I'm gonna ask you to check uh, if your sound uh, and your share screen work second uh, announcement is that we are gonna have uh, a poster session after the collider session. So it's gonna last one hour. So we, we are gonna to have to assign you to different breakout rooms. So we will uh, give you many details uh, at the end of the, of the collider session. Okay, so bear with us. Sorry, there is an ambulance. So I will just gonna Okay, it's gone, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so we are gonna give uh, more details about the poster session at the end of the Collider session, but stay with us. Uh, we have many interesting posters at the end. And now Martin uh, would like to show a, a few slides.